We'll call this budget information session to order. Everyone have two weeks off enjoying themselves? No? Yeah. Just one? <laughs> All right. Just one. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. We'll start uh, with our introduction and budget every, uh, overview. Uh, Mr. Administrator, take us away. Well, good morning, commissioners. And uh, uh, I do thank you for the time. That was a, a great vacation. I'm very, very happy to be able to do that, you know? Um, and, you know, for Jill, for holding down the port in Della, she, I, I, I got on, you know, when I went to port, I got on an email and there was nothing in there, so she wouldn't even let me cheat. Um, and so it was, uh, it, it was kind of a forced relaxation, so that was a very good thing. Um, but I am, um, you know, back and we're ready to, you know, begin the kind of the meat of the budget process. Today is the first budget information session. Um, as we've done over the last several years, these budget information sessions, is to give you, you know, as the policymakers, the ability to look in depth in the budget, to ask questions, to um, ask depart both our OMB staff and our department directors, because it gives us a real sense um, of what we're trying to accomplish with a budget, which is a policy document. It's setting the framework uh, for next year's activities and next year's priorities. Um, so this year, we'll, that format will remain pretty much the same with just a few adjustments. Uh, you'll be, be able to follow the document for each department. Um, generally, there's only one document, and, and it's page numbered, so we should make that easy. And we've asked the analyst, and if we forget, just please remind us, and that way we can track along and, uh, and make sure everybody's on the same page, um, you know, literally. So, um, but remember, this is a conversation. You know, it's designed in this type of a format to where we can engage and, and ask questions um, and, you know, uh, give us a sense of what we agree with, what we don't agree with. And so we can, when, when, when I come back to you next month with a budget recommendation, it'll be reflective of the priorities and the concerns and issues raised as part of these discussions. And I'll have a better sense uh, from you about where um, you want to go and uh, issues that are concerns that you have. And so this is, these are real important in terms of framing that final budget recommendation that'll come to you here July 19th. Um, so, you know, as in terms of priorities, as I've been talking and, and with you for several months, um, uh, we have our shared priorities, those programs and services that we want to fund and enhance for our residents, for our businesses, and for our visitors. You know, we've, um, while we've not made any decisions, uh, we do have the decision packages. All of them will be presented. Um, they'll be part of the budget, so everything will be out. Um, they, I will tell you my recommendation will not have all those in there, <laughs> um, but that gives you a full sense of the rest or the request and why people are requesting things. That kind of gives you a sense of that need. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll pare that down and bring back a, an overall budget recommendation. You'll see uh, also as we go through that there's four priorities. Now, this, these are not new. We've discussed this. This year, we're going to implement the coordinated access model, uh, addressing mental health services for our residents. Um, that is a priority. It, it will be a priority in the funding and for implementation. Uh, next, we know that we have to remain competitive in this environment, and so we have to pay competitive wages uh, for our employees. Um, we're, we are seeing record numbers of turnover, uh, people leaving, making different choices, um, and that impacts our ability to deliver services to our residents. It has a direct impact. And so we have to address that as part of our priorities this year. Um, three, we know that as we presented, we have a backlog in some of our local roads that we really need to address infrastructure. That's roads, bridges, um, you know, and so we're going to, we're going to try to include a piece into that and get a and work with you on what type of a funding level is, we're comfortable with. Because the final priority, which you've been very clear about, is to keep our property tax burden as low as possible uh, for our residents. So we're going to bring those four priorities in, um, along with all the other things within the budget, um, and that'll be a part of the recommendation that'll come to you on July 19th. So with those thoughts, I want to turn it over to our new budget director, Chris Rose, and he will uh, kick off this budget session. Again, this is a conversation format. If you have questions, concerns, feel free uh, to, you know, at any time, you know, bring those up and then we can uh, try to address that. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chris. Good morning, commissioners. Turn my microphone on. Good morning, commissioners, and I echo what the administrator said. Thank you for giving us all of this time to go through the budget with you. Um, 
you know, I have heard it said that the, the budget is the single most important policy document that is, that is adopted every year. I've also heard that uh, local governments show their love with their annual budget, and, and that, is, that is something that it's, it's good to, to bring before you and, and work through these with you, so thank you. Um, I'm gonna go back all the way to about January, right after the, the holiday break, we got with all of our uh, departments and gave them some guidance, opened up our budget system, and, and talked through what the budget would look like and how we were gonna get it done. Uh, of course, we met with you, our county commission, in January to uh, workshop the, the uh, strategic plan. Uh, you can remember uh, Aubrey and Kevin at uh, Lelman Exchange going through uh, your priorities and talking through the things that we talked through that day. Uh, it has informed what we've done as we've gone since that time. Uh, we continue to work with departments. There have been many meetings as we go, and uh, we have kept your priorities and the priorities that the administrator spoke about in mind as we're building this budget. So today you see the culmination of that work, and, and we really appreciate it. The, uh, the administrator did bring up that there are some slight differences. You, you will be able to uh, follow Page one comes right after page two, after page three in the documents. And so hopefully uh, we'll, we will take it in order. Uh, we're not going to read it. We're not going to hit every single word on the page, but you're going to see it in the order that we've got there. Uh, and then um, the other change that you're going to see uh, more than any other is we're going to present the forecast, the estimate, now instead of when we used to back in February. We have better data a little deeper into the year, and you're gonna see Jim Abernathy doing that in a moment. Uh, so we, we hope that will give you a little better information as well. Um, and so I, I'm gonna switch just a little bit and talk. When you adopt the budget, it, it really is more than just one budget. It's several budgets. It, it divides into operating and capital, obviously. And then once we're in the operating, uh, the general fund is our largest fund out there, and it also has the most pressure on it. So that's the one that, that we're probably gonna spend the most time on as we go through these and, and talk about it, and uh, we have spent the most time on that coming up to this point as well. So, uh, you know, you'll, you'll hear from our property appraiser momentarily here about where property taxes are at, where the role is at, and, um, you know that property taxes are our single largest revenue in the general fund, as we talked to. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it back to you, or no, to the property appraiser. So Mr. Twitty, thank you so much. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Barry. Good morning, commissioners. Glad to be here with you, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, give you a little, little overview of what we're seeing from, obviously, the taxable value side, and, um, and we can talk a little bit about what we're seeing going forward as well. So we'll start with, with the values. Um, value trends, I think you guys have seen this slide in, in years past. Ignore the red line for right now because that is just new construction. Um, so you're reading off the left axis here and you can see that our just value number is up over 179 billion for um, Pinellas County for 2022. And taxable value is up to 110 billion. So those reflect changes of in just value, which is equivalent to market. Um, that's an, an upward increase of 20% year over year. And for taxable value, it's 12%, and which equates to $12 billion in taxable. Um, and that, of course, that's countywide, and, and that's measured off the general fund. Um, just to give you some, some history there, you can see going back, that equates to you know, 10 years of positive growth at an average of about 7.3% per year on the taxable value side. Um, and 2021, CPI hit 7%. So obviously the Save Our Homes cap hit the 3% maximum for this year. And we expect it to do so again next year based on where everything is trending. So keep that in mind. Most years we've been plus or minus 2%. Um, you know, a lot of years it was even at 1% or even under. So 
it will be at that 3% cap for the next couple of years, it looks like. Um, yeah, just the May tw trailing 12 for CPI right now is 8.6%. <coughs> Sorry. Um, jump into the red line, that's new construction. You can see it, um, it jumped up this year. It went up about, I think it's 20 some odd percent, about 24% and broke the billion dollar number. So about 1.1 billion of new construction. So that equates to about 9% of the taxable value growth for 2022. And then if you break down that taxable value of new construction, you can see roughly 41% is in residential and about a third is multifamily rental apartments. So. You can't drive down a major artery without seeing a multifamily project going up uh, somewhere around town. So those all fall in that, that piece of the pie there. And then the balance of 25% is your other general commercial type properties. You sh we're still seeing the self storage, some hospitalities still being built, some uh, build to suit retail, industrial, all those things. But we, <coughs> I'm sorry, I got to tickle my throat. It keeps um, taking my breath away. Um, but we um, obviously we're in infill county. We're the densest in the state, so we've got those challenges of new growth going forward, and you know, doing smart development in a um, in a logical way. Thank you, Barry. So let's look at the market a little bit. So these are the the stats based on our data. This is not realtor data at this point. I'll, the next slide will reflect realtor data. But you can see this includes all sale activity for a single family for 2021, and then it goes back to 2012, so you can see the trend. But you can see we were up about 2,000 sales, so we hit a new, a new high water mark in sale activity for single family, um, about 16,700 homes changed hands with a median sale price of 345,000. And you can see this, the median size is tailing downward slightly, not, not much. I mean, the graph is a little more dramatic than the actual numbers when you look at that square footage. And that's a function of people buying older housing stock and being price point sensitive and continuing to, to gobble up the, those smaller, older homes and, and renovate them. You can see the median price per square up to 240 for the year and the median sale price increase was 21%, which dovetails back with our overall just value increase of, of 20%. Mike, Mike, question. Yes. On those increases that you're talking about, the caps that we're, we're referring to, the 3% caps are on existing say, you know, homes that are... That, right. So if, they, if they're switching hands, they're, uh, they're resetting? Correct. Um, and, those, and, and, and we've had... Do we have a sense of that number of those sales transactions that occurred that aren't going to be there in effect they're not capped um, well basically so, let's go back here yeah. all 16,700 of those sales are not capped those are all resets so all of those property owners are going to go to market after they cross the next january one so they'll get the benefit of any assessment cap and exemptions that the seller had for this year or you know so if somebody, somebody buys this year, they get the benefit of their Save Our Homes cap and any exemptions they might have. You know, even if they were a veteran, um, disabled veteran, got a full 100% TNP and are paying no taxes, they basically get that exemption through the end of the year. Then January 1 is where all those caps and exemptions come off. And now they have to file for Homestead on their own before March 1 and the process starts over. But now their assessed value goes all the way up to, to the just market value, and the process starts over again. But, but Mike, the, uh, in theory, I'm just saying, those, mm -hmm. let's say we, just, we were all just switching homes here, and um, you're, you're protected with portability on all 16,000 homes. The, the, Correct, but that, it's a function of the, those are not all Florida buyers. I understand. Right. right. And so, not everybody had much of a cap or a so differential. That's why I was port. wondering when you say all of those are, are not capped. I, I'm not sure I. 
Well, no, they're all, all those new buyers are going to undergo a reset. I get that. Yes, new but buyers. then some will have different amounts of potential portability that will come off okay. and reduce right. their assessed value. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Sorry about that. Yeah. And um, to give you a little perspective on that, I'll jump ahead. So Pinellas to Pinellas moves in 2021, we had it 54%. And in state, meaning out in the state, but outside of Pinellas County, but then moved into Pinellas County was 21%. And those from out of state coming into Pinellas was 25%. Now those, that data is not perfect because our best data is, is from our people that filed for Homestead because we actually really know their last address. When they don't file for Homestead, we have to take, take it off deeds or we have to take it off where they're declaring where their mailing address is going to be. So that, that one gets a little squishier on the non-Homesteaders. Yes. Thank you. Um, for your median size um, on the for the downwards yellow line, I guess, does that also include some of the homes that have been purchased, older homes that um, have been added to for square footage, whether it's adding additional story going up or in some instance, some persons are purchasing two properties next to each other and making that one and renovating it so it becomes one property. Right. This would just be whatever the parcel was at Initially. time of sale. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so if they bought two adjacent and combined them, it's not gonna really be reflected okay. in there as the larger home until after they combine it, becomes one parcel, and then they at sell the it again. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So this is the um, Pinellas Realtor data here. You can see the median sale price for April. April is their latest month of stats. Um, in about another week to 10 days, we'll have their May numbers, which will be, I think that'll be quite telling because that will get us past, a couple of months past March when the interest rates started to bump up. So everything's delayed when it comes to, you know, people buying homes, people qualifying for mortgages and then the closings occurring. You need that, it's usually a, you know, a two month lag cycle there before you really start to see any meaningful numbers. But you can see the median sale price and that's just just for the month of April. So just the sales that occurred in the month of April. But 440, you know, that's a lot lot higher than the 345 that we saw for the entire year in um, in mass for last year. Median days of contract still very tight. Months of supply still under a month. I suspect the next report we're going to see we're going to see that months of supply break one month for the first time in quite a while. Um, you know, with all those pressures, with rising property insurance costs, rising flood insurance costs, inflation, um, and obviously the interest rates, those are all going to play a factor in starting to, con to um, add more to the supply and constrict demand. So... I always welcome your presentations, Mike, because they're so data-driven. But I had, and I don't mean but, mm -hmm. yesterday I was in a conversation with my realtor friend who was telling me the story about she had a property on the beach and the buyer that she had for that property was willing to pay cash and the property was already above the market, you know, what the market was usually going for. And, the, and they offered $300,000 over the list price. Mm -hmm. And they still didn't get the property. Eventually, the property sold <laughs> that same day for 400000 over the list price. So to me... That is insanity. It's artificially inflating the value of these properties. And what does something like that do to the next property in that same vicinity and or even in that building? I mean, surely, please tell me it cannot keep on going on like this. There's got to be a breaking point. And 
So that's my number one right. really big issue when we talk about these things, because they're not real. And so what, where does that leave? This is very personal to mm -hmm. me because of my granddaughter and her little family are so wanting to get their first home. What on earth does that do for the first time home buyer? We're going to get to a place where we can't keep our kids, our grandkids, or our teachers, our firefighters, any of these people here in the county. No, it's, it's problematic. Um, obviously, that was a beach property, right? That, so that's a bit of an extreme example. I haven't seen anything go that, that high over, over ask, but it doesn't shock me. Um, you know, we've got, we've got basically a great wealth migration going on. So that has fueled the fire since the pandemic. And, you know, our, our number one at this point, last year it was new, the top three were New York, Illinois, and California in that order. And traditionally, California would never even crack our top 10 of, you know, people migrating in. This year to date, California is number one. So, and then New York is two and Illinois is three. And, and then um, after that, our international buyers, so our non-US buyers have started to elevate. Um, and they fall in like the, the number four slot right now when you take them all, you know, the entire rest of the globe outside of the US. So that is obviously creating the supply pressure that we have and they have much more buying power than our local residents do. You know, um, you know they, they've amassed wealth in, in their states or they've sold out of their properties which are valued at a much greater number. Some of them are even taking a loss. I know a lot of them in Illinois have actually taken a loss but are still coming to Florida and are able to buy more house than, than they may have had there. So it's, it's, a, it's a problem. I don't know that there's a great solution other than we get to a, a calming and a market correction and, and people just <clears throat> stop you know, beating our door down and, and flowing in. But I mean, Florida is always going to be desirable. And so, and, and Pinellas is the, you know, like we said, is the densest in the state. So we've got more pressure on first time home buyers than probably any other county in that regard. And, you know, our surrounding counties do have development land and, and it's going to be one of those situations where some people may have to move out to those fringe counties and commute in or, um, you know, Chair Justice and I were even talking about, you know, more communal housing where you have, um, you know, like you have the student apartments with um, where there's multiple master bedrooms with their own bath, you know, and a shared common space and kitchen. And you can deliver that product cheaper than you can building, you know, individual units for everyone because the bulk of those dollars are in the plumbing and things like that and, and that living space. And so we're going to have to get creative on, on some solutions to, um, to provide some housing here. And, you know, it's probably going to make us have to go up and densify in certain, you know, areas in order to um, accommodate people here locally. And obviously in our urban cores, it's just, it happens in every, in every, um, around every CBD, you know, it's always gonna cost more to be in, in the core and it's usually gets cheaper as you get out to the fringe. And we've seen that phenomena, it's, you know, it's everywhere, not, not only in America, but all around the world, you know. So let me show you this slide because this will show you those pressures. And I think as, you know, the, inf the interest rates rise. It's a little bit of a tough one for us because even though interest rates are rising, that only forces the first time home buyers and those that need mortgages. It puts them further behind the eight ball in competition with people coming from out of market that have a lot of cash in their pocket. Over 30% of the single family sales right now are cash buyers and over 50% of the condo buyers are cash buyers. But you can see on this slide here, this is MLS data of active listings going back for the last decade. And you can, you can see that back in 2012, we were up to as high as almost 10,000 active listings. So obviously you could get a, a fairly good buy back then. But then you can see how it started to squeeze and then it really, really came down 
you know, and, and went below the 2,000 active um, after the pandemic. And then if we put demand on that same chart, you can see demand has not really, you know, obviously month, month over month it's going to change based on seasonal fluctuations, but it hasn't moved a great deal compared to, to actives. And you can see the, the, um, the demand is, sale activity is basically covered up the number of active listings. So until we start to get some relief there and a little bit of a gap, you're, you're not going to see, um, you know, a whole lot of, you know, bright light for, for our first time home buyers. Um, you know, that, that differential has, has got to increase. Um, talking about homesteaders versus non-homesteaders, we're at about 64% of our residential property owners are homesteaded. That went down by 1% over the prior year. We had been ticking up at one, about 1% 1 a year over the last several. So we, we took you know, a small step backwards there with homestead. Something to keep in mind too, um, <clears throat> you know, your non-homesteaders, they're capped at 10%, but they're not capped at 10% on school board millages. So school board millages, they pay against full just market value. So, so if millage rates hold the same for them, they can technically be above, they could experience above a 10% tax increase. And let's talk recapture rule a little bit because this helps people understand better what happens when you go through market cycles, um, when things go up and down. I know many of you, you know, several of you watched what happened in the Great Recession and how we did start coming down the backside. I know you can see here that, so you can see the just market value is rising and that's the blue line, the assessed value is your, is your capped value, so that's limited to 3% or CPI, whichever is less. And you can see that differential build over time. And that's the amount that, as David was referring to, that's, that's your portability that you could take from one homestead to the next. So that's a good thing that allows people that are within Florida to, to move, move out of their existing home, move to another, and still get some relief. They don't complete, you know, obviously they reset at the other, but then they get to take that differential off their new market value to get to their new starting assessed value going forward. However, when just market turns downward, a lot of property owners think that they're immediately going to see relief. Um, and that is not the case because assessed value continues to rise if there's a differential until assessed value meets market value. So you can see that, that situation occurring here. So you can actually see your assessed value continuing to rise as the market is declining, and until assessed value reaches just market, then they ride down together because assess can never exceed just market. So then they can ride down, and then when the market turns again, that's when you start to see the differential um, gap increase again, and they've established a new base at wherever that bottom was. So I just wanted to show you guys there. So that, that actually provides government some protection in a when the, when the market does turn, because you know, sometimes those shoes drop rather quickly. Um, we don't anticipate this, you know, any change here to be like it was last time, but as dramatic because of how tight that supply is, we don't see just a flood of supply coming on the market like we did uh, last time around. Commissioner Flowers yeah. has a question. Thank you. I'm not sure if you would be the right person to answer this, but do you know the percentage um, that a person could add on to their home, increasing the square footage of uh, their home before it would move them into a new taxable value? Well, anything they add, we put on as new construction over their, whatever their Save Our Homes cap is. Okay. So that adds to it. If they do renovations generally inside their four walls, that doesn't really affect their, 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 um, their cap. Okay. It might affect their just market value, but not their assessed value. Okay. 
I've gotten a couple of questions because, of course, people are trying to look at solutions for their children coming back. And one, you know, was right. I would like to add some square footage mm -hmm. onto my home um, so that it would accommodate them and mm -hmm. allow them to perhaps have um, a different entrance, like, a, you know, a back door or whatever, instead of coming through the sure. rest of the house. But I guess there were questions, well, not guess, there were questions about, so how much, what's the percentage, 5%, 10%, 30% that I can add on, and still um, I'm paying my uh, my current taxable value versus if I add on to, you know, pass that percentage, now it puts me... Yeah, there's no percentage number, so if you add whatever the square footage is that you add, you know, whatever, we, we pick up those permits, we pick up that new construction, we add, we add that value on. Obviously, we're not, we're generally not at 100% of what they have into that. So, but it, it can, um, it can move their, their taxable value upward, but it's still a much more cost effective solution for a lot of people because they still are benefiting from that save our homes cap on the rest of their property. And once they add that square footage, then that value falls under their cap going forward. So then it's protected going forward. Any other questions related to value? I was going to do a shameless plug um, at the end here. I just wanted to let you all know our, our new website is standing up. It's running in parallel with our pcpao.org site. So we currently have the new site at .com. We've been uh, roughing a, or sanding a couple rough edges off here and there and trying to um, perfect a few things. We just got approved for .gov domain yesterday. So the new site is actually going to, its permanent home is going to be at pcpao.gov. So we'll be transitioning there and then we'll, we'll start a kind of a countdown on the old .org site and, and it will start to fade away. Um, but wanted to let you guys know that that is in the works and that we've got a lot of new resources out there via our new website. People can sign up for uh, ease new newsletters that we do monthly and they target they're targeted for homeowners, real estate professionals, or business owners. So you can sign up for any of, any or all of those. You can obviously we've got a social media page on Facebook, and we are actively doing public education sessions every month. We've been doing those for over a year now, and you can see the archives of those on our YouTube channel. And the next one coming up just happens to be first-time home buyers in July, so watch for that. People can register on our site and and. We've been doing those both in person and virtually. I think we're going to do the next one in person because with the first time home buyers, it's, it's really good to do the face to face thing with them. And we're hosting those down at our South County Service Center uh, training room. And that's just a list of the public education series uh, sessions that we've hosted so far. Um, we rotate them around based on time of year. Any other questions? Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, so back to this first time home buyers, which we've been talking about now for a while, and folks that have lived here for X number of years, whether they've been renters or family members or whatever, to, to have them be able to take advantage of a property's low taxable value, there would obviously have to be a change at the state level for that, correct? I mean, so that you're not, automatically assuming a new the, the new value that would have to occur somewhere else to address these first-time buyers that have been Floridians for X number of years say whatever that is three years five years ten years um, correct yeah yes and that might be better handled as some form of an exemption or, or maybe it's a an abatement of a piece of their assessed value for first couple of years as they're getting on their feet, you know, something like that. So there may be something creative that could be could be done to help Floridians out that have, you know, been here for X amount of years. I don't, yeah. um, but it would have to be done at the legislative level. Right. I mean, obviously the state is always attractive, as you said, but it's clearly gotten in the last three years much more attractive. And it's, and it's great to have new folks coming here, but somehow to protect our first time buyers, it's just, you know, it seems like there could be a creative solution, but thank you, Mike. Sure. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's great to have your information because it's all the actual factual data because most of what we 
know of real estate transactions is the anecdotal stories that we hear. And, right. Um, and the 54% the Pinellas to Pinellas was probably one of the biggest ones because, again, anecdotally, what I hear is, I'd love to sell my house, I'd love to move, but where am I going to? And sure, I can make a huge profit on my home that I lived in for 20 years, but I lose all of that and then some when I try and buy even something comparable, you know, if I just want to shift, you mm -hmm. know. And um, so that's what, that's what we hear. And uh, um, uh, in the barbershop the other day, there was two older gentlemen talking about their situation, and, and they had a friend who had moved up to Citrus County and bought a nice piece of land and had one he wanted his friend to buy. And, and the advice he got was, well, if you're going to go, make sure you, you really want to go because you can't come back. You know, because of the, the values of selling that up there, you could not come back and buy your old house again. So it's just that 54% was what really, really jumped out to me when you were talking about that data point, mm -hmm. uh, Pinellas to Pinellas moves. That, that was fascinating to me. Yeah, and, and some of that, I think, was driven because of the pandemic. People, people were setting up home offices. A lot of people actually bought more square footage than they had before. Um, but you did. You, you had a mix. So I mean, some some were upsizing, some were downsizing. You know, some sold out of their 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 stuff on the beaches or on the water and got good dollars for it. And then they did downsize. You know, they were empty nesting, and so you you had both phenomenons going on. Very good. Thank you very much. All right. We thank always you. Always appreciate all. it. No problem. Let me know if you guys need anything else. Okay, Chris. So, Jim Abernathy is going to present the budget forecast for you. Uh, and I'll give him a minute to get set up here. Uh, if, it, if it helps you with the Granicus number, it's 22-0657A. Uh, that might help you find it. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn everything over to Jim. Good morning, Commissioners. <clears throat> I'm Jim Abernathy with the Office of Management and Budget, and, <clears throat> and I'm here to present the budget forecast for the FY23 to FY28. So the, the purpose of the forecast is we forecast because of goal 5.2 of the strategic plan, which is to be responsible stewards of the, of the public's resources. While the budget is our roadmap for one fiscal year, we believe it is important to know what impacts that decisions made today may have on long-term fiscal sustainability of the county, which will help our decision makers make better informed choices. The forecast is meant to show the cumulative effects of all the decisions we make, both positive and negative, allowing for changes to be made where necessary or desired. Having this information in advance can help identify both opportunities and challenges, allowing time to fully study the choices being presented to us. The forecast has been a standalone document since the Great Recession, with this being the 13th year that we've done this document. Uh, periodic updates are made to the forecast as new information becomes available. We will include the updated forecast in the adopted budget book. The document includes forecasts for 10 of the county's key funds. The details of the forecast are in your staff report and will be available on the Citizens Budget website for the public. Today, however, we will focus mainly on the general fund, the tourist development tax fund, and the transportation trust fund. Before we look at the individual fund forecasts, uh, let's take a look at how we developed the forecast. Uh, our forecast is developed using a set of assumptions that are applied to current information. We use more than 30 assumptions with some affecting specific funds, such as the change in fuel tax revenue, while others apply to all 10, such as the change in personnel costs for salary and health insurance. These assumptions are based on uh, are based on input from both internal and external sources, including our departments and agencies, the state and federal government, and local and national economists. However, several of the assumptions we used when the budget process began several months ago have already changed. You will see that the initial assumptions for changes in the taxable values were much lower than the information that we have included in the budget. For example, our assumption for countywide taxable value at the time was 6.8%. 
But as the property appraiser just told you, uh, the actual increase from the June 1st report is around 12%. So as you're reading this document, please remember this is an ever-changing product that we update throughout the year as new information becomes available and new policies and programs are implemented. Yeah, again, I just want to make sure I'm clear now. The 12% increase in taxable values, is that take into account all the caps? I mean, are all the caps in place at that point yes. and we're still getting 12%? Yes. 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 So I, if I didn't say it before, oh my goodness. <laughs> it's like, wow. Yeah, it's um, double what it was last year. Double. Yeah, last year it was six, six and a half point, ish. Yeah, 6.8%, I think. Right. So, so all of our 3% caps, all of our 10% caps on commercial, on and all of that's factored into that's that. That's all factored in there. This is fully loaded, and as they start looking at, at projected revenue numbers, that's accounted for within those projections. So the 4% on that previous five, or 5.4%, um, is that uh, uh, is that assumption based on the on the information that is equivalent to 12 percent the or the, are we just saying that it was based on something lower than 12 but we chose a, a, a smaller number the the 5.4 percent that you're referring to is for fy24 right uh, because fy23 we've are we already have a number and we bake that into the into the forecast so um, so the assumptions that are up on the screen are for FY24 and beyond. And what we used is uh, what the state had projected on a county-wide, they, they do a county by county, mm -hmm. and we used a number that the, the state provided several months ago. We expect that will, uh, could be higher, but we won't know uh, for several months as they get more information in over, over the rest of the year with the sales. If they start slowing down, that 5.4% might be more realistic or might be lower than that. And in this coming budget, what number have you assumed in the numbers that we'll be seeing? We're at 12.2%. Oh, we are what? using that. Correct. correct. Uh, okay. Yeah, correct. Okay. We're so, using that for assumption purposes and, and for setting that. Any And then when you actually apply and you'll see on the budget recommendation, then it's a question of how much we're going to spend. And then we adjust the rate to accommodate the expenditure levels. Okay. I got it. Commissioner Long has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have two questions. One is for Mike, and the other one is for Jim. So if you would allow me, I'd appreciate Absolutely. it. So Mike, maybe you said this, and maybe I was just busy taking notes and missed it. Usually you give us some projection about when the economic, um, you know, gurus, for lack of a better word to say it, are projecting that there will be a downturn in not only the economy, but in all of these issues that we're talking about today. Because trying to absorb all the different sources of information is always difficult at best to siphon through and find the actual facts. So do you have any of those kind of projections that might help us <laughs> at the end of the day figure out um, well, I left my crystal ball back at the office. Oh, come but... on. <laughs> I've been waiting a whole year to hear you again. <laughs> um, I mean, a lot of them are talking about, obviously, in 24 being our, our, our bigger, or I'm sorry, in 23, being our bigger slowdown. Um, you know, I think we're still going to ride through the majority of this year and still see strong sale, you know, solid sale numbers as far as the prices people are paying, but we're gonna, we're gonna see that demand start to tighten, which is gonna create some rise in supply, the, the over, over list price bidding wars should start to subside on a lot of properties and get down to where it's ask or less, back to a, a closer to a normal market, um, which that will obviously provide some hope for, you know, first time buyers and those that, you know, are locals that are, that are trying to, um, to move from one property to the next. Um, it's, it's hard because there's so many macroeconomic factors that are playing into what's going on here locally as well. But then we have our own Florida and Pinellas County insulation factors too that 
protect us from some of the an other anomalies that may occur at a national or global level. So there's a lot of things going on and a lot of people pulling strings um, all over the place. So depending on policies um, that, that happen at a, you know, a state and a national level, um, you know, obviously we've got crazy gas prices right now where, you know, people are trying to digest that. And we don't know where, where how the insurance market's gonna shake out in Florida. So we have a lot of things that do not bode well for a normal healthy housing market, yet our housing market has been on fire, um, you know, in spite of some of those factors. <clears throat> but as the market starts to get more in balance, those things will creep in and start to have more, more um, influence and consumers will have more confidence concerns. So they'll shop harder, you know. So that's about as much as I can give you. I, I can't, you know, quote any hard numbers and tell you, yes, you know, next um, February 2nd is the day your granddaughter should buy a house. Um, <laughs> I can't um, make that type of a call. All right, thank you so much. Sure. That's helpful though, uh, for you to point out all those different things. And Jim, I'm so sorry. When you started your presentation today, you talked about three specific funds that you were gonna focus on. And I have the general fund, the TDC, and what was the third one? The transportation. Oh, I thought it was, but I wasn't absolutely certain. Thank you. Yeah. So I look forward to all of that. And uh, very good, everyone. Thanks for all this data. But, you know. <laughs> I'm glad you asked me that easier question than what you asked. <laughs> <laughs> Mike. Well, I don't know. One of those is very difficult. They're all difficult. I stayed just to help you out, Jim. Thanks, Mike. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, back to this. And I remember a few months ago, I had said something to Barry about, you know, getting a macroeconomist in here to kind of give us an education on on the variables that we have to, that are out there. I mean, I, his, that, per, that particular person's forecast could be very different than the next five. So more of an understanding about what the variables are that, we, that would affect us here. Like some of these migration, you talked about you know, migrations from other states. Is that gonna continue? Is it gonna slow down? What are the variables on that level? And, and again, I. It can be different opinions, but at least we can have a sense of the variables that are gonna affect us, maybe more so than normal in Florida, that normally we have some of those outside variables, but not, not like we've had in the last, last three years. So um, yeah, I, I was getting ready to tape your, your candid response so that I could show people, uh, but, but, because it is, it's difficult to, to pin down, and yet really we're trying to anticipate what's happening in the next few years, so. Um, well, at some point, everybody from out of state should have already bought their Florida house, right? They, are they going to run out at some point? But depends I don't know. How, depends how much those other states keep pushing people out. So that's right. And um, so I would imagine that those adjustments will be taking place to some degree to kind of balance it all out. But mm -hmm. thanks, thanks, Mike. So um, at the beginning of the budget process, uh, the departments were given these assumptions uh, to help them develop their FY23 request. Uh, these assumptions were applied to the current year uh, budget to help shape the 23 budget, uh, which you will be pre presented next month uh, and to come up with the projections in future years. The assumptions are not applied to one-time items, uh, for example, reimbursements from hurricanes or tropical storms or specific needs that are applied to only a specific year. In addition to the economic assumptions, we, we build in all the known set changes that, are, uh, that will affect our funds, such as any adopted rate changes uh, in a particular fund. Uh, we try to do this analysis for each of the funds uh, within the, the forecast. So uh, for a, a local economic outlook, uh, maybe I'll go to your, uh, your question, Commissioner Long. Um, in the first few months of the COVID-19 pandemic, the U.S. unemployment rate shot up to 14.7%, while Florida's rate hit 13.9%. During the following 24 months, the unemployment rate has fallen to 3.6% nationally, 3.2% in Florida, and an unbelievably low 2.4% in Pinellas. 
Since April 2020, more than 21.1 million jobs have been added nationwide, almost replacing the number of jobs that were lost in March and April alone of 2020. As a comparison, from the end of the Great Recession to the beginning of COVID-19, which was more than nine years, 22.7 million jobs were added uh, in total. The housing market, as uh, the property appraiser just uh, discussed, uh, continues to maintain strength while ri with rising year-over-year -year home sales and prices. Median sales prices increased by 10.3% to $294,400, the ninth, the ninth straight year of price increases. And it, uh, for FY22, as we stated earlier, the taxable value increased by 6.8% uh, to 98.8 zero billion dollars. Um, the taxable values are estimated, as we just heard, to increase 12, uh, over 12% 12 to $109.9 billion in, for FY23. And there'll be another release from the property appraiser uh, in just a couple weeks. Uh, since FY 2003, the average growth has been 4.9% annually as you can see from the chart, our taxable values are now tracking slightly above the historical trend, factoring in the 4.9% uh, annual increase. There are many factors that can impact the accuracy of the forecast. Some of these we can control, such as the utility rates or the millage rate. Others are outside of our control. Either the state or federal government can impose new regulatory requirements or shift funding responsibilities to the county level. The economy may grow at a slower pace than our projections, uh, potentially reducing available resources, or the economy could, could grow faster, uh, thus potentially providing unanticipated resources. Since we don't assume new policy in the forecast, when specific items are scheduled to end, we uh, try to reflect that in our projections. So now let's start looking at the, at the funds within the forecast. The Emergency Medical Services Fund is balanced throughout the forecast period and maintains uh, the millage rate of 0.9158, which has been in place since FY13. The forecast includes uh, the funding request for both the ambulance contract and the first responders contract, or first responders funding. For the Surface Water Utility Fund, the ERU growth is anticipated to remain flat throughout the forecast period. The revenues are based on a rate of $117.74 per ERU, which is unchanged from FY17. Uh, the mitigation credits are intended to reduce the assessments for developed property that have on-site stormwater management systems that reduce stormwater runoff impacts from the county, uh, from the property to the county system. For the Capital Projects Fund, uh, the current penny, which is known as Penny 4, runs through December 2029. Because the CIP is a six-year plan of projects, needed expenditures exceed projected revenues. Uh, adjustments to the timing of projects are made each year to keep the fund balanced and account for project delays. The forecast for the projects, for the Capital Projects Fund, shows that the fund will be balanced in FY 23 and 24. However, expenditures uh, are projected to exceed revenues beginning in, in FY25. Uh, the um, Barry, is that the change we've seen from the effort to balance, or is it is, and or the ARPA funds that we've gotten in? Well, trying to get it balanced was really a reflection of kind of updating some of our uh, projections. Remember when when the um, when code originally hit, we projected a revenue decrease. And, and, and then we also saw project cost increases. Um, well, then we saw the economy pick up. And so now it's come into where it's about balanced, both with because of the economic impact and because of using ARPA for some projects. And so it was a combination of both. Here what you're seeing is in the first couple of years of the project, we started putting in dollars to program and design. And so now you're getting that ramp up of construction hitting in those that 25 year, 25-26 uh, time period. And so we'll have to come back to you with a funding mechanism to keep the, either either slow down the project or um, do some gap financing as you've done in the past to be able to have those projects go forward. 
but overall keep it balanced over that 10 year period. In the airport revenue and operating fund, uh, the total expenditures exceed revenue through most of the forecast period. period. However, uh, the revenues from operations are enough to cover operating expenditures. The fluctuations in expenditures are caused by the timing of capital projects. Fund balance and grant revenue is used to fund uh, many capital improvement projects. The sewer fund, uh, the current rate plan includes annual increases of 9.5% through FY23 and assumes a 9.5% increase in FY24 and 3% in remaining years of the forecast. And this is based on the model developed by the rate consultant prior to FY19. A new rate study will kick off next month for FY24 through 27. Uh, any recommended changes will be brought to the board for approval. Uh, in the water fund, the current rate plan includes annual increases of 1% through FY23 and assumes these rate increases continue through the forecast period. These rate increases are expected to provide sufficient revenue to maintain reserves and fund capital replacement needs. A rate study for the water fund will also, uh, for FY24 to FY27, will be, will be conducted to determine what changes to rates are necessary for the water fund as well. Immediately following this presentation, uh, you will hear from utilities who will, uh, who will get you, will get into more details on their budget request. In the solid waste fund, the operating expenses remain relatively constant over the forecast period. Capital expense, expenses will vary depending on the need of, in each particular year, ranging between 18 and $35 million. The current power purchase agreement expires in December of 2024, causing deficits starting in FY25. Accumulated fund balance will be used to maintain a balanced budget through the forecast period as needed. So now we'll get, uh, we'll get more detail on the, uh, on the last three funds. In the general fund, the forecast indicates that the that the fund is balanced over the forecast period without millage increases while maintaining reserves at or above the target level. Departments continue to look for efficiency in their operations without negatively impacting the services provided to our citizens, visitors, and businesses. Maintaining this positive condition assumes continued use of non-recurring funds for one-time expenditures and continuing to balance the desires to improve and expand services with the limited resources available to accomplish these desires. This graph, graph demonstrates the balance in the general fund over the six year forecast period. As you can see, we're able to maintain an excess of 15% of revenue in reserves throughout the forecast period based on our current projections. These projections on based on are based on maintaining current level, current year service levels with inflationary increases for personal services and operating according to the assumptions. Real quick, I'll make sure I understand that. Um, again, you're saying the blue, the blue graph is our reserves, the reserve percentages. So you're saying that in 23, um, the reserve levels would be 20, 20, 8, 23, 24%? Yes, somewhere around there. And over that period, you're, sh you're saying that our reserves are going to climb up to that? Based on the 50, projections. 55%. That's based on the millage, or excuse me, the values that we're talking about today. Yes. And all the others. Okay. Yes. Okay. And, and we don't have a, any change in the millage from the, the current level. Right. I understand. So, yeah. That, yeah. so that can each change. Each year we'll have a strategy. So from a forecast standpoint, what you're wanting to do is make sure that you're not going below your, your reserve levels, right? And so you're looking at your expenditures and your projections and those assumptions. It doesn't mean that throughout this planning period, we won't take actions to um, uh, adjust those reserve levels if we think they're too high or too low. So this is st strictly for a forecasting exercise. The, um, and this was before our, our new finance director was here and Bill was on his way. He said that I was asking him about those reserve levels. Right normally historically been around 15 percent and maybe looking at more like at 16 16 and a half percent 70 might be the the smart i'm not I'm talking about strategically um, 
increased reserves that for one-time expenditures that you have in mind. Right. But just normally, um, it might be as a little bit higher than that 15%, but not certainly the levels you're seeing here. Well, and, and I think as we as we get into that in a macro sense, we, we have to look at, you know, lots of different factors in that. And, and we certainly can use those for one-time um, services. So we don't incur debt, you know, or other things. And that's part of kind of putting everything out on the table and making some of those decisions. We certainly don't believe that we'll ever, you know, have come to you with a budget with a 60% reserve level. Okay, you know that's that's not responsible. It's not being responsible for our taxpayer. Um, but if we have other big ticket items coming down the pike and saving up for those to be able to expend, and and, and it's a planned expenditure of one-time money, well then that's that's a smart you know um, thing to do. But we need to be transparent about it of why we're keeping that reserve level. And so that's kind of the, what we're looking at, and, we'll, and we can make some of those assumptions. But from this is strictly from a forecasting to make sure we're in good financial shape based upon what we see in all of our different revenue sources and expenditures. Commissioner Long. Yes, uh, along the same lines that Commissioner Eggers was talking about as it relates to our reserves, it's, and it seems to me, somebody please correct me if I'm wrong, that we've had a policy in place that was established many years ago, and I'm looking at Commissioner Seal for her historical perspective, at 15%. Mm -hmm. And it has been at 15% for as long as I have been on this commission, which now is 10 years, give or take a month or two. So my question to you is, how long has that been in place at the 15%? Does it, do you know, Karen? I don't know off the top of my head, but I remember when we established, I mean, I remember establishing it because, um, you know, going back in history, when I first came on the commission, our reserves were very low. And so we, a lot of cities have reserve levels. And so we finally said, you know, I think it was after the Great Recession. So my point being, if you think about how long, and it's more than a decade, mm -hmm. we've had it at 15%. If you just pretend like we did it just before Commissioner Justice and I came here, well then, given the way things have increased in cost and given the cost of construction and the supply chain issues and, 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 have you done any projections at all to figure out what that 15% equates to today versus what it was a decade ago, and maybe it should be more than 15%? Well, we, we can certainly uh, do that. So a 15% is a guideline, um, and you have had strong fiscal policies in place for a number of years, um, and, and so that is a pretty standard GFOA, Government Finance Officers Association, has best practices in terms of reserve levels and fiscal policies, things like don't spend, you know, one-time money for one-time purposes and, th you know, all those things. You've really followed those for many, many years. Um, so it is a minimum, but it does adjust up. As your budget goes up, then the 15% is op overall of an increasing number. And so it does adjust. The question, I think, is, is 15% enough, right, with some of these other factors that you mentioned? We can certainly look at that, but it is pretty um, standard in terms of that gives you a comfort level. And it's not only that you want a 15% reserve, but you want cash flow. And so you have to look at the way in which you, you operate and establish cash flow guidelines as part of your fiscal policies. Um, and we have those in place also. All right, thank you. In the tourist, uh, in the tourist development tax fund, um, other than our ongoing commitment to help fund beach renourishment projects, the county's commitment to capital projects is expected to end in FY23. There are three projects at various stages of negotiation for county support, the Philly Spring Training Facility in, in Clearwater, the, uh, the Salvador Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, and the St. Petersburg Historical Society, uh, but final agreements have not been reached. If it, or when these projects are finalized, they will be added to the forecast for future reimbursement payments. This graph shows the projected revenues and expenditures for the 60% portion of the fund used for operating. 
Uh, as you can see, the operating revenues exceed operating expenditures each year of the forecast. And because of the record setting bed tax co collections in recent year, reserves are projected to be well in excess of the target each year of the forecast. If revenue projections fall short, the accumulated operating reserves could be used to maintain the marketing and promotions program as needed. And, and so I'm sorry to interject, but you know, this is a good example where we have to look at reserve levels because you know, we, we, ha we have a lot of different factors in terms of capital construction potentials, um, but you also have things like beach nourishment and the issues that we're having with uh, uh, the Corps of Engineers and, and, and that. And, and so currently, you know, we fund just a small portion of that and if that changes. So, you know, those are, this is an area where I think you could argue that your reserve levels really are needed until some of these other issues are resolved before you can make good decisions. And there, um, there is discussion currently on the TDC about a dedication of a percentage or increased percentage for sand um, more than what we currently dedicate to that because of those issues that the administrator brought up. There's one, one TDC member wants to do that. Another TDC member approached the topic of dedicating a portion of the tax for uh, arts in general and with more specifics later. But so the TDC is seeing these same numbers and seeing that we're not expending the capital side of it um, and starting to have ideas of how to dedicate and not just one time, but dedicate for five or 10 years or permanent percentage. So those conversations are happening just so that they're on your radar. And Commissioner Seal. This is more on just the general tourist development, um, TDC. Um, I, I know I've had some feedback as to staffing up there. Is that starting to take place or what's happening? It's on our agenda for discussion for next week's TDC meeting. Is it? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, this graph shows the projected revenues and expenditures for the 40% portion <clears throat> of the fund dedicated to the capital funding program within CVB. As you can see, revenue from capital projects exceed capital expenditures each year of the forecast. Because the county does not have uh, capital commitments beyond FY23, the reserves of the capital funding program is projected to continue to grow well in excess of the annual beach renourishment payment throughout the forecast period. And just to uh, talk on that, the, our, our current commitment each year is half of one of the percents uh, is dedicated to beach nourishment each year. So um, half of the value of 1% is, um, is transferred each year to the capital fund for beach projects. And when that was dedicated, it was closer to 3 million and now it's closer to 7 million uh, or 8 million. It, yeah, it'll, it's close to $8 million will be that portion of the, the transfer. The, uh, uh, and Kelly Levy is giving a presentation on beach nourishment to the TDC next week as well. Projected balances, projected balance in the reserves for capital projects increases from almost 75 million in FY23 to 236.5 million in FY28. The three projects mentioned earlier currently are asking for $60.3 million in funding. In the Transportation Trust Fund, the addition of the dedicated millage from the general fund in FY22 greatly improved the outlook for the fund during the forecast period, uh, which is proposed to be maintained in FY23. The fuel tax revenue is recovering from the effects of COVID on the demand for fuel, but is projected to remain flat long-term. As a reminder, the fuel tax revenue is collected based on number of gallons sold, not on the price per gallon. Revenues and expenditures are expected to move at the same pace most of the forecast period. Uh, as a reminder, the ninth cent fuel tax is scheduled to expire in December of 2026. We would like to remind everyone that our Citizens Guide to the Budget website includes some very helpful information on the Pinellas County budget, including the six-year forecast, videos from the budget related from budget-related meetings, presentations from, from the meetings and other helpful information, um, such as the budget document, the budget calendar, the budget process, trim notice information, and that sort of information. 
So this concludes the uh, presentation of the forecasts. Uh, I want to thank everyone at OMB for helping uh, in all of our departments. Uh, and Any questions? Commissioner Eggers. So you're going to be coming back with a recommendation in the middle of July based on the conversation we're having here today. Correct. Um, so we will be having um, um, over the next, well, I guess, three days this week and three days next week, a look at all of the funds yes. and get you the feedback that you need. So we don't really have to in interject all of those today. This yeah, is we're, just yeah, kind we're of doing overview. kind of the bigger picture yeah. overview yeah. first. We're, and so, for instance, we're going to get up with Megan, you know, and uh, our analyst is going to you know, present kind of a, uh, the issues they're dealing with and, we'll, you know, what they're seeing and, and, and then... So we'll get into each individual one. This gives you kind of that overview. And then even within this, you know, we're they're going to be that, you know, she wants to build this widget. And, well, we haven't made a decision whether I'm going to recommend that or not. Um, part of that is is getting the numbers to see what the revenue is available, where our priorities are, and, and things like that. So all that's kind of in progress. So we're kind of going down two paths at once. But having the discussion and getting... Um, any concerns or issues and things that you have will help get you know give us that feedback as we kind of set those priorities. Very good. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And I'm seeing a, a 95 slide uh, deck. On this next presentation, we got 95. Uh, I can't believe I would have never let 95 slides. Twitty's, come to you. Twitty's running for the door. You know, no, this is the entire budget. This, that is not <laughs> what will be presented. Okay, it's going to be a discussion of um, a an executive summary of all the detail that is provided. <laughs> well, we yes, it is in your packet. It's it um, in. Yeah, it says utilities. That's the 95 slides. Yeah, that's the okay, and that's the this is the the you know down and dirty and of everything within um, that budget. So, but but there's no presentation specific. No, it's not a presentation. Okay. Each one of these will not be a. There's not we we're not including PowerPoint presentations. Okay. We didn't want a dog and pony show. We wanted a discussion. Okay. And so Veronica is going to kick it off and really talk about kind of the highlight of the issues and then. They can then, you know, because sometimes I, I want the analysts to talk first because sometimes we talk about everything but budget numbers, you know, and uh, so, and then we'll turn it over and you can discuss that with the department head and so. so good. <laughs> good morning, commissioners. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come and share this information with you today on the FY23 utilities budget. It, it is a very large and complicated budget and um, challenging, but really, really interesting to work with. Um, the, the, the first page, we're going to focus on going through, you know, the, the, the narrative of the first 11 pages of the 95-page document. The rest is all, uh, and, and I'll point out where things are important for you. For you. So the, the, the purpose statement, I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I did want to emphasize the why because a lot of times we talk about our missions and purpose statements don't always tell you why we do what we do. And the bottom line is for utilities is that they're providing reliable services to sustain life. And everything they do is about sustaining life. So I, I think that's important to point out. So the, the topics for discussion, still on the first page, the one, the most significant topic that I wanted to talk to you about some is the proposed user fee changes for FY23. Um, you all know that we had the Stantec Consulting come in and work with us. They worked with staff for several months looking at every, every user fee, doing the cost of service, and coming up with recommendations for changes to those fees so that we're recapturing the cost of, of service that is given to individuals that receive a benefit from the service as opposed to being spread across the charges to all the ratepayers. So you, you, you received those results on May 19th, and I think that you had a few questions and things that we did follow up on uh, since then. The, 
one thing I want to just kind of make sure that I'm saying this not so much for you, but maybe for anyone else that may be watching, these are not changes to the water, sewer, or reclaimed rates for your usage um, from month to month. The, these are the specific user fees for usually a one-time or a monthly fee that is specific to an individual or an individual property. So the projected impact, as we told you um, on the 19th, based on the recommendations, is about a million dollars um, in FY23 over FY22. And the, the user fees are only about 2% of the, the overall water and sewer budget, but they do produce um, about $5 million to $6 million uh, every year. So that's a million dollars on top of that. And I just wanted to read something real quick. Uh, yeah, okay. So I believe Commissioner Long had asked about the four-year impact, and one of the things that you had asked us to look at is our recommendation was the fee changes with a few phased in over time uh, to, for a couple of reasons, partly because of state statute and partly because of trying to make sure we mitigate the, the impact each year on, on certain customers. So, but you had asked for us to uh, give you a scenario with no phased in, I believe, and additional phased in. So in those scenarios, the, the uh, let's see, with our, our original recommended partial phasing, that 54 uh, user fees would increase, 51 would decrease, and there would be 12 new user fees introduced, and the four-year impact for that, which is what you've received in your presentation already, is 4.6 million over the next four years. If we do additional phasing, um, going back over it, there were 34 more fees that were looked at as f and being able to f phase in a total of 37 fees instead of just three fees would result in increased revenue of about $2.9 million over the next four years. So that would go down to the 2.9. If we did no phasing in, I thought I saw that in here somewhere. It would be $6.9 million if we didn't phase even the three that we recommended. Commissioners, what she's referring to is the email that Hillary uh, sent to you on Monday. Yes. Okay. And going back to our presentation here. Oh, okay. Uh, no, still on page one, actually. <laughs> I'll, I'll get there, I promise. There was just something that important to point out, too, as well. So one of the things that's going to be uh, in the, when we do the proposed budget, one of the changes that's going to be in there is going to be the recommendation that we waive the fee for reclaimed meter installation for existing users, existing customers that are actively using the reclaimed water. And these are the customers that are being identified on the front end of the um, the AMI project, the initiative with the automated meter infrastructure, or meter, um, that contract's coming to you, I believe, next week at your board meeting next week. So this ties in with that. And the reason that we're doing that is because with the county receiving the, the ARPA grant funding from the federal government, um, we were able to use some ARPA funding to cover sewer projects in the CIP other projects as well, but specifically in the sewer CIP that freed up money to be able to not charge for that meter for people that have already been using the service. So that's the... And then also we looked at, okay, so these are the people that are using the service now. They're active. They're paying for it already. What about in the future, you know, after this initiative is, is completed with the, um, with the meter uh, being installed? At that point in our fees, um, the reclaimed meters for most residential customers would be in the range of $590 in the future. So we've looked at ways that we might be able to offer the opportunity to do monthly payments on that and looking at, oh, you know, if we took that over five years, which would come to you for approval as part of the user fees in the future. Uh, well, it'll be in there now if you approve it in, in October. But we're trying to keep the rate or the payment down to about at least less than $10 a month for people. 
and it, it, that would give people the opportunity. If they want to pay for it all at one time, they know they're going to be there a long time, that's great. If they want to pay for it over time, that would be a possibility. And then the, the fee would change, stay with the property. It, you know, the person that may be leaving soon could let us do it, but then leave it with the property and not have to continue paying for it. So I hope that makes sense. Um, uh, so new, new uh, since we're installing meters uh, in our reclaim system, um, there'll be people that have not taken advantage of being on the system and they're still being ex charged an accessibility, an access fee or whatever that is. Uh, is this something that we're going to get out to encourage people to get on the system? Um, so, you know, that they, it's running right in front of their house, but they're not plugged in. Um, are we going to be able to add people um, that are, that, that have the service out in front of their home? Yeah, so if, if customers are already paying an availability fee and that um, infrastructure is built out in their neighborhood, they can certainly connect to the system. They are able to do that. So I don't know if it's an encouragement or, or not, but it, it's there. And they're, um, they're able to do that. And, and just what Veronica was, was talking about with the meter fee, as we go and implement these meters into existing uh, customers that are already connected and using the reclaimed water. And we're hoping to be able to waive that fee, and that's what's in our proposal to do that. And that is um, because of the ARPA dollars that the board approved towards different sewer projects. But they're current customers. Current, on yes. Not ones that were taught. I just asked the question about accessing new customers, encouraging new folks to get online. So um, I believe uh, one of the stipulations that we included, and because these ARPA dollars are a one-time payment, we can't offer a free meter in perpetuity because you know we only have limited ARPA dollars available. We are utilizing an October 1 cutoff because that is when these user fees would go into effect, is October 1 of this year. So if you're a current user as of October 1, you're connected to our system, uh, what we're proposing is that we can waive those fees up until that date, but any new users that come on the system after that would then have to pay those fees. But we're looking at spreading that out over a period of time to where over a five-year period, they'd be paying about $10 a month for that meter fee. But if I'm hearing this now, uh, can can if I wanted to all of a sudden, uh, availability fee, I've been paying, right. I want to get online, how long does it take to to provide connection there? Oh, it just takes a matter of days. Yeah, if you just contact our customer service and request to be connected, we can schedule a time okay. to get out there and do that. So Absolutely. there are folks that mm -hmm. could gain in the next six months by getting online. Yes. So to speak, have that fee waived. Yes. Okay. Thank you. County Attorney? Yeah, I, I just wanted to make one thing clear. We're not spending ARPA dollars on this AMI project. This is... Right money made available by ARPA dollars being spent elsewhere within the system. So I, I, I just wanted to be clear, it kind of got a little muddy there for a second. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody's clear on that. Oh, no, they, they shared that in previous meetings about the Correct. County Attorney just didn't want uh, waters muddied any more than they were. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so and we're... <clears throat> We're going to be going from page one down to page two now. This is the, the proposed new user fees table. Um, those will be added to the document when we give you the proposed document in July. The two that are the most significant to point out are the private sewer system annual operating permit fee for non-residential and residential. And so it's on the, towards the top of page two in the table, you'll see new private sewer system annual operating. There'll be about $300 and then about $30 if it's a, a residential type property being used for private, but just a residential type property. So that will tie back down into then going into our budget because the budget reflects the county strategic plan and now I'm at the bottom of page two and the direct the department's work plan, the, those two fees tie into supporting the private sewer lateral initiative for the private sewer systems element. You have the, the four categories of the private lateral sewer laterals. 
the initiative you approved on February 22nd, and that is built into this budget. That's one of the most uh, significant things in terms of increasing the budget to achieve the work plan for the coming year. And I'm sorry, Commissioner Gerard has a question. I just had a question. Do we have a, uh, an inspection system now for private sewer systems? No, we do not. <clears throat> yeah, okay. so that the policy yeah, that, <laughs> that you all approved in February will enable us to do that. And just to clarify these two fees, there are no fees for residential customers. It's just a residential equivalent. So when we're looking at private systems, we wanted to differentiate between large, you know, we have large commercial developments with pump stations and manholes. And then you might have a business that's just a single lateral, just like a home. So we didn't want to treat those two things as the same fee. So just to clarify that point. So we'll have to hire staff to be doing those inspections? Yes, and that is part of this budget package is for staff um, to do the private system, specifically dedicated to the private system okay. right. policy. Um, yeah. okay. Question, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, Megan, again, we're bringing meters to the system, reclaim meters to the system for a reason. So instead of just saying everybody that's using it, here's a, it's gonna be free for the users, free. The, the meter installation will not cost our existing users anything. And new ones that have availability to it by the October 1st will not, there won't be any additional charges. Is that, okay. Yes, okay. that's what we're proposing. And the idea behind the meters, again, if you could just <laughs> qualitatively say the real benefit to having these meters in place. The benefit is really demand management, just going back to our Reclaim Water Master Plan, if you recall, with unmetered residential services, we have no means to really manage demands of where the reclaim water is going, who's using, are they using it within our watering restriction guidelines. So it's really a matter of fairness, if you will. It's a, it's a pay for use type system, similar to what we do on the drinking water side. And so we'll be developing that new uh, usage rate structure in our this coming year's um, rate plan. But yeah, it's really to manage demand so we can have better availability and access to all of our reclaim water customers. Yeah, and, and servicing the systems and everything else, which <clears throat> typically means you have to shut this, you know, shut it off by eight o'clock. And you know, we've had some real, some real availability issues. So absolutely. So hopefully this will um, even that out a little bit. Um, yes. Also, also good. Well, there'll be inline uh, system or inline meters as well to kind of monitor for leaks and. Are we going to have that kind of built in? I mean, that's one of the issues that we're not sure about. Are we losing some water or reclaimed along the way? Yeah, we we may look into investing in some of those meters within the system. I know with, with AMI, just the residential meters alone uh, can inform many of these decisions. I mean, we have meters leaving the facility, and... Um, once we install those residential meters, I mean, we'll really be able to target and hone in on what are those areas that maybe we need to meter additionally or go in and investigate. But I think we're going to get a lot of information from implementing just the residential meters. But any rate issues with regard to reclaim won't be affected by this capital expenditure. Any rate change recommendations that you guys are going to come forward with will not be affected by these capital expenditures. Correct, so we're, ho we're offsetting the capital expenditure with that supplementation of the ARPA dollars. Yeah, just the that rate, capital. Right, just yeah. that. The rate changes, you know, with that metered rate structure will be different. It's not gonna be a flat rate, you know, once we start evaluating what, what does that look like. But no, it will not be affected by this Capital project, this, yeah, this but, cap. yeah, but the, the the programs that you that you approved previously with the sewer ladder and all those things, those have been built into the current rate structure that was approved, the, right? The ninth point three percent. Right. If so, you're talking about the sewer laterals. Yeah, right, I was yeah. talking about reclaim still. Um, the AMI project, right? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, it will not be affected by the capital. Thank you. Okay, and then. Going into page three at the top, the, the overall budget, if you take transfers and reserves out of it as far as operating and personnel and capital, the 
The total de department budget is $278.2 million. The increase of 25.9, a uh, big part of that is the 15.8 million increase in the water and sewer CIP projects. And Jackie will talk about that later uh, as we go through the CIP information. Uh, the, we were just talking about the private sewer laterals and part of the implementation of that in the work plan is the addition of the seven full-time employees to be able to implement it. And that is all encompassed within the, the proposed budget. In the operating expenses, the roughly $6.9 million increase, the items that are most important there, it does include the rebates as part of the private sewer lateral program, $800,000 is what we, we hope to be able to, to uh, reimburse to people through that program. Uh, not, about $900,000 of that is chemicals. Uh, you know, everybody knows supply costs are going up. Chemicals are going up uh, substantially for water and, and sewer operations. Uh, electricity also going up, Duke Energy. So that was uh, one of the significant increases. And a $700,000 increase in the uh, Tampa Bay water purchase. Uh, that was, that's based on their estimates. They project usage for the different partners and that's our projected increase. And that, that's in their rate increases. And part, a good part of that for them, it's similar to us, uh, investment in their renewal and replacement fund. And then, you know, you just have the, the overall summary of revenues and then expenditures for department-wide going into page four. And just wanted to point out again that with the FTE count at the bottom of um, the table on page four, going from 429.9 to 438.9 employees. That reflects the seven employees that are going to help implement the private sewer laterals, so that's new. And then the transfer of two existing positions from other departments, OMB and admin services, into utilities. So that's, that's why you see that FTE increase. They and I'd like to just point out that out if I can, commissioners. Um, so we've, we, we used to have both a full service and a non-full service uh, model where you had um, the Office of Management and Budget that performed not only budget duties, but the actual financial functions for that department. That was the case in utilities. Megan and her, at her department didn't have her own finance people. And so then they were kind of serving Bill, they were kind of serving Megan, they were kind of doing these, and we've kind of breaking away from that to where she has her um, uh, staff doing the day-to-day -day financial functions of a very large department under this model. So it's a transferring of people, one there, and also in payables out of um, uh, over in administrative services. And so that's where those positions come from. So it's a restacking of the deck, but I think it gives us um, more control directly at the department level to do the financial functions and then have a budget analyst separately look and um, work with them and project and then offer ideas as kind of an independent view. That's a, a model change that um, is, uh, has been rough to implement this year, um, but we're, we're getting there. Um, and in the long term, I think it'll serve us well. And, and I know we're not doing uh, OMB until next week, but <laughs> is that a decrease in the overall FTEs in that department? Yes. Okay. Just I assume, but I didn't want to assume. No, this is we're not doubling up. We're <laughs> we're definitely uh, reallocating. Okay. And then just like we have in our budget document, and you'll see this again in July in the proposed budget, we do lay out the the budgets by program, and this is the more public, forward-facing uh, information to help people see, you know, the cost for water versus the cost for sewer services. Um, you have the three different funds, the water revenue and operating, uh, the water renewal and replacement, which is the capital improvement program that Jackie will talk about more, and then the water impact fee fund, which is not really active right now. Um, just wanted to point out in a couple of these that you'll see new is the, um, the American Rescue Plan Act fund, that 1045 at the top of these programs for water and sewer, uh, we'll show you some of the funds and from ARPA that are being built into the budget for 23. Question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we've had a lot of, I guess properly, criticism about some of the overflows um, that we've, uh, everybody has some of them, but we've been criticized as well. Now, what kinds of things are we doing? I think the laterals are one of them, continuing to work on our waistline 
resurfacing, if you will, mm -hmm. on the inside. Um, and then a capital project down in Mid County that, could you just touch on briefly kind of what we're doing in this coming budget to address some of those overflow issues? Just yeah, we are doing a number of things. And in, when you look at our budget, it really reflects a heavy emphasis on the wastewater collection side. And so it's a combination of building capacity in certain areas where what we call bottlenecks, where certain pipelines weren't built large enough to handle a certain amount of inflow and infiltration because you're, you're always gonna have a certain amount no matter how much you try to reduce it. Um, lining projects, manhole rehabilitation, pump station rehabilitation. We've also got plant facility projects going on to help with both power but also capacity. And um, we've got a number of projects going on. And I, I do talk about that a little bit more in depth in, in a minute, but okay. absolutely. It's, it's, it's really one of our main focuses. And as you know, our wastewater collection program, we're looking at our entire capital improvement program there. We're implementing an asset management program with our wastewater collection system so that we can better prioritize those critical assets that need to be addressed first and foremost. The, the rate um, adjustments that you made were directly targeted to increase the infrastructure to be able to handle the capacity that you're specifically addressing. But, and so they're doing it in a very targeted manner by getting data, tar you know, and, and uh, looking at sewer laterals and things like that in capacity, but also things like mobile home parks. Remember, we have the mm -hmm. 15 targeted mobile home parks uh, where we're also working. So it's kind of an all, all in approach because we need to address it. We need to address that now. Um, and but they're doing it in a very um, methodical manner. And when that study came out a few years ago, it asked for nine percent increases. Everybody kind of was like, "Wow, what's going on here?" Mm -hmm. And I think part of it is what you're discussing now. I'm assuming that a lot of it was because of the increased emphasis on the capital side. Yeah, and if you look at our six-year CIP plan, about it's just over sixty percent is the wastewater collection, you know, for the sewer side. Yeah. So it definitely is reflected in our capital program. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and so really, it's, it's for the rest of mine is just um, just you know pointing out that the, the programs are split out. Um, the way this comes out in the document is you'll see reserves for the entire department, but then you'll see the breakdown of the reserves in the you know uh, the water revenue and operating fund versus the water CIP fund uh, renewal and replacement. So when you see the reserves and the transfers as programs, it gives you the fund that that, pro, that that transfer or that reserve is related to. And really the only other thing is um, in the forecast, which is in, in back in your attachments as well, I think it's attachment, I can't remember if it's three or four, whatever it is now, but the, um, anyway, the, the forecast, um, stops at FY28. When we get to FY29, our debt service on the sewer is going to go down from about $14 million a year right now to roughly $5 million a year. So we'll have a nice drop in the, in the payback on that. And then in FY32, with the current debt that we have for sewer, that goes away. So you don't, you don't see that in our forecast right now, but that is something good that's coming down the road. One more question on the, I saw on page six, the uh, F-22 accomplishments, $27 million in grants, uh, two grants? Yeah, no. I think, I don't want to steal Megan's thunder on that. Oh, She's gonna... oh I'm sorry. That's, <laughs> I thought, okay, I apologize. I'll let Megan I just, tell you about that because yeah, it is, yeah. I just, that, that wasn't figured into these rates study three years ago. No. That's newfound uh -huh. yeah. monies. Yeah. Okay. So how we're using well, that. Okay. Just want to make sure. Thank yeah. you. Commissioner oh, Peters had a question. Yeah, you know, I saw that you got $1.8 million in um, past due dollars. How do you get that back? I mean, it says in there that you're going to get it back, but I'm just curious how you get that back. I'm sorry, can you repeat $1.8 million in what? $1.8 million in past due money owed. And it says that you're going to, that's on page seven. So you're going to, or you, did you, um, maybe I'm misreading it, collected $1.8 out of the 1.8. Yes. That, so that, you got 90%. You got it collected already. So I just was reading that wrong. 
Yeah, that's correct. That has already been collected. That was due to COVID. If you recall, a couple of years ago, at the onset of COVID, we froze shutoffs for non-payment of utility bills due to the extreme economic situation. And uh, as a result, there were obviously people that you know didn't pay their bill. We put everyone on a payment plan. We structured a payment plan that was approved, um, I believe, by the board through a resolution, and we were successfully able to uh, recoup those costs. Okay, and, and we've actually naturally migrated into that area of accomplishments and all that, that Megan's going to cover. Just before we do, I just want to make sure I pointed out, um, it is attachment four in the back of the book, pages 53 to 56, that give you the water and sewer fund forecasts. The user fees are pages 41 to 52 as attachment three, and when Jackie will be, be talking later, we have the CIP reports are paid, uh, attachment five. So that's why you have a 95-page document. So thank you very much for your time. Commissioner Eggers has already memorized all those pages, by the way. <laughs> so anyway, Megan's going to take over now. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you, Veronica, and good morning, commissioners. Megan Ross, Director of Utilities. First, uh, again, I just want to thank Veronica and Jackie. Those They are both our OMB analysts, and you'll be hearing from Jackie in a moment, uh, for their continued support throughout the budget development process. So the budget presented to you today reflects the priorities for the utilities department, which include infrastructure strategy and support, customer satisfaction, and employee leadership and development. These priorities are aimed at fulfilling our mission of providing high quality services for water, wastewater, and reclaimed water. So going to our first priority, which is infrastructure, uh, we place a large emphasis, as I mentioned earlier, on our wastewater systems. This includes both wastewater treatment facilities and the collection systems, with the outcome being to protect water quality through the reduction of pollution caused by sewer overflows, while also providing reliable wastewater and reclaimed water services to our customers. So this initiative is demonstrated through our wastewater collection system program. This is one of our key initiatives. Uh, and within that program is the private sewer lateral policy, which was adopted by the board in February of this year. And we're currently moving forward with a comprehensive implementation plan that would support this policy. And that's intended to kick off in fiscal year 23. Uh, moving on to wastewater facilities, we have a, a major wastewater facility project, the Grit Headworks project. That's located at the South Cross Bayou Water Reclamation Facility. It's currently completing construction and will increase capacity at the front end of that facility by about 50%. A second major construction project nearing completion in our collection system this year is the Park Boulevard Sewer Force Main Project. This connects one of our, actually our largest wastewater pump station to the South Cross Bayou Treatment Facility and that, again, will ensure we have adequate capacity and reliability in the collection system. So a big improvement there. Additionally, in the North County, we have a major electrical systems upgrade that is planned at the W.E. Dunn Water Reclamation Facility. This will ensure power resiliency at the treatment plant. That project is uh, just now completing design and will begin construction or scheduled this coming fiscal year in 23. Uh, making significant progress on the drinking water side by investing in various components of that infrastructure. And uh, namely, we have the Gulf Beach Pump Station Upgrade Project that was awarded earlier this year in terms of design, and a preliminary design is currently underway. The design is scheduled to be completed in fiscal year 23, followed by construction in the following fiscal years 24 and 25. And that what this project is intended to do is really increase our reliability of delivering drinking water, sp specifically to the South Beaches, our customers in the South Beaches area. Uh, this year, we completed the design of the North County Water Booster Station Variable Frequency Drive Improvements Project. That helps to upgrade those pumping systems up there. Uh, that will ma better manage demands, enhance water system resiliency, and construction is scheduled to begin again in fiscal year 23. Completion is expected in fiscal year 25. We've also recently completed a countywide water storage tank rehabilitation program that proactively ensures the adequate maintenance and structural integrity of our water system tanks. Eight of our nine total storage tanks have been completely rehabilitated. And the ninth one is located at the Gulf Beach Booster Station. So that ninth one will be included in that before mentioned uh, project that we have scheduled. 
Our capital budget also includes, again, it funding for the advanced metering infrastructure project, which will be coming to you next week on June 21st with a recommendation for approval of award. This project will provide leak detection, advanced billing functions, and an improved data set for demand management of both our drinking water and our reclaimed water systems. So these initiatives, uh, along with our continued collaboration and support of Tampa Bay Water, will further our ability to continue providing high quality services for drinking water. One of our collaborative programs that I'd like to highlight is the Tampa Bay Water's Water Quality Project, which is aimed at optimizing and improving drinking water quality throughout the region and specifically for Pinellas County. Uh, that project, pilot testing, of several technologies at various water production sites owned by Tampa Bay Water has recently concluded. And a final report summarizing the results and the conceptual costs associated with that will be ready for review and discussion with the member governments in July. Another regional project recently initiated is the Regional Resource Recovery Facility in partnership with our neighboring utilities solid waste and other stakeholders. This facility will aim to beneficially reuse waste streams and eliminate the need for land application of biosolids generated by wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, phase one, which was approved by the board, has started and will again result in a comprehensive preliminary engineering report, which aims to build a facility by 2029. Of course, an important part of investing in infrastructure is in ensuring an adequate funding program. And this past year, we embarked on a strategy to target available grant programs that aligned with these initiatives. As a result, we did receive one of the largest uh, infrastructure funding grants that our department has ever received, at least in recent history. Uh, we applied and were approved for $28.4 million in grant funding from the Resilient Florida Grant Program. And this includes improvements to 15 mobile home park collection systems, as well as hardening of various critical infrastructure buildings. So this funding combined with funding received from ARPA will serve as a critical component of our overall funding strategy for these initiatives. So along with these alternative funding sources comes with it uh, additional timeline and reporting requirements that does necessitate a fresh look at how we can deliver projects in a more efficient and effective manner. And to that end, the department is currently seeking qualified program management consultants for additional project management support that will enable our robust capital program while also seeking additional alternative funding sources that provide for continued financial viability for the utility. So next, just wanna highlight some improvements we've made to enhance one of our highest priorities, which is customer satisfaction. As we mentioned earlier, going back to the advanced metering infrastructure project, one of the greatest benefits will be for our customers. The system will allow us to move towards a monthly billing cycle as opposed to every other month, along with an online portal that will allow customers to be in control of their own water usage and help mitigate water leaks and conserve water. So additionally, this will provide uh, customers with convenient access for billing inquiries, Instead of having to call on the phone, they can simply access this portal, make payments, and, and look up uh, various information on their water bills. This year, uh, we're making an upgrade to our current payment system to a new platform that will allow customers to make payments at various retail locations. So this would include retail locations like Target, Walmart, 7-Eleven, CVS Pharmacy. There's, there's thousands of them. Payments can also be made in electronic means, including Apple Pay, Alexa, PayPal, Amazon Pay, and Google Pay. So we're really coming up to the modern way of paying bills now. Planned activation for the new payment system is scheduled to be this November. So more information regarding this system will be coming out soon. And if, if any customers are listening, they can check back on our website as we approach that date. Our website again is uh, pinellascounty.org slash utilities. So the utilities department, and just a reminder, we do continue that real-time messaging through the Everbridge system via text message and phone call if, if customers do experience outages due to various water uh, line breaks, et cetera. And finally, we made significant strides towards supporting employee leadership and development through a combination of defined career paths for in-grade development, 
a formula formalized leadership training programs for promotional advancement, and employee recognition programs for ongoing and continued support and motivation of staff. So specifically, the department implemented over 110 career paths. These are for classified positions to promote growth and development within the employee's existing uh, position class. Then we've also embarked on, uh, we've had two years now of our Discover the Leader in Utilities program, which is a leadership program aimed to provide skills and competencies that helps our staff be more competitive so that they can be promoted within our organization. Um, to date, 75 employees have participated in the program. 47 have graduated, and overall there's been a total of 22 promotions among participants. And to incentivize and motivate employees throughout the duration of their career with us, we have our Utilities Employee Recognition Program, which has been in place now for over a year, and this provides additional opportunities for supervisors to recognize employees for their performance in a manner that aligns with our, our values as an organization. So in closing, I wanna just thank you for your time today and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Commissioner Eggers. Barry, I, I may have missed it in the beginning. I, I apologize. What, what um, rate increase on, uh, does this budget include, I'm sure, like everywhere, uh, salary increase uh, proposal? Well, so we're going to get into salaries overall. So we baked in a 3%. Okay. I will be coming back to you with something um, different. Um, but we, so just for the purposes of building the budget out, they use the traditional 3%. Um, and then we're going to have to adjust everything based upon the decision that's made with that. Commissioner Flowers. Super kudos to the um, utilization of technology for payments because that's, easier and may help um, even with people paying late, you know, they're out and about. Um, no Zelle, no Cash App, since both of those platforms do have a business component piece. Say that one more time. No, no Zelle, Z-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, or Cash App. You were, to, you were talking about the other platforms yeah, for payment? Yeah, I'll, I'll have to check on that. I know we have numerous ways to pay. I don't know about Zelle. I'll have to check on that specifically, but... <laughs> okay. um, I'm not aware of that particular app. Yeah, it's available. becoming a much larger platform. Yeah. A couple of other things in my life, um, and both of those, especially uh, Cash App for Business, not the regular okay. Cash App, but Cash App for Business. Those are two common ones that people use pretty much, as well as, of course, yeah. Apple Pay, you know, and others. But if you're going to use all of those, maybe. Include. Okay, yeah, we'll check, we'll check on that. Thank you. Further questions or discussion? Thank you very much. Very okay. thorough. I'm sorry, Mr. Rose. Forgive me, Mr. Chair. We still have the capital improvement portion of water and oh. sewer to be presented. They're one of the three utilities, one of the three uh, enterprise funds. So Jackie will be making that presentation starting on page eight. Thank you. Good morning. Jackie Trainer, uh, capital improvement budget manager. And mine will be brief. Um, Megan has hit a lot of the highlights on the, the good projects, but the um, current year FY22 estimate and proposed six-year plan, the 23 through 28 plan for water is 206.6 million and for sewer is 451.4 million. Um, the proposed plan that has the project budget detail report, so it's project by project, that starts on page 57 of your attachment, so you'll see each project outline there what their uh, proposed plan is. Uh, the proposed plan does include increased funding requests and uh, some new projects. The water forecast is balanced throughout the forecast plan. However, the sewer um, fund will require some further reprioritization and balancing. As Megan mentioned, they are looking at some alternative funding sources. Um, we really need to look at um, how we can deliver the projects at the proposed pace requested. We may need to look at borrowing if we are able to use some of these consultants to help us come in and do project management and project delivery. So um, that is reflected on the sewer forecast as a potential borrowing in 24. Um, but as you know, our consultants, our contractors, our materials supplies, everything has increased. So we are seeing increased in existing projects needing more funding, even without any kind of scope change. 
um, all of these increases are coming on. Um, we also need to look at whether we have the staff resources to do all these projects, but again, utilities is looking at bringing in um, contracted project management to help with that. Grant funded projects will become a priority. If we look at borrowing, those will have to become a priority because you will have to deliver those projects. And we'll be working with um, utilities to help balance that and look at potential uh, borrowing if we need to go that route. You'll see two contracts that really address project management, both one for utilities and a separate one for public works, um, because those are the ones where we need to be able to move on in a timely manner, especially on these grant projects, to be able to deliver on time. And uh, that'll be coming back to you. I don't know when, but. That item, excuse me, um, do we have um, a sense of what that percentage of project cost is? Is it like a 5%? Uh, what what do those management companies charge oh, uh, for, for that for project management? Yeah. Well, that, well, that'll all have to come out in the negotiating of the scope once we select a qualified consultant. But, and we will have to determine what projects we want them to, right. you know, cover. So yeah, I think anywhere from like five to eight percent of the total, um, you know, project dollars. Um, the increased funding for existing projects and the new project requests, they start on page 88, and we've included those uh, really to provide transparency as to what's been added to the plan. Um, we have a threshold of if a project's um, plan has increased 250000 and 15%, we require that justification for that increased funding. So that's what's outlined um, on that attachment. Um, historically, utilities has not received grants, and Megan has really already covered this. But now they um, have received grant funding. The Mobile Home Communities Wastewater Collection System Improvements has a Restore Act grant for design for $2 million and a Resilient Florida grant for $25 million for the construction. So that project is basically 100% grant funded. Um, and they also received the, yeah, it was very good. They also received uh, the re award from Resilient Florida for the building hardening for $3.4 million. And again, Megan has covered these. Uh, the revised ARPA spending plan approved uh, four sewer, um, I'm sorry, three sewer project and one water project. Um, the South Cross Bayou dewatering improvements, South Cross Bayou denitrification filter rehab, the septic to sewer, so that's all on the sewer side, and then um, the manufactured home community water distribution will be ARPA funded. Um, so we got it, we got that covered on both the sewer and the water side for that one. And that's it. Uh, Megan covered the accomplishments. Uh, a lot of a lot of good things coming online this year. So. And I think just in summary, you, you, you commented on the 95 pages. There, there's, you know, we're, we're hitting the summary, but, you know, as you're, you have time to look back and see those individual capital projects, they're outlined there. And so it's, it's a lot of, <clears throat> they're outlined within this document. And so it's, it is a lot of detail, and we're not going to go through all, all of those, but certainly, you know, at your leisure, you can, you can kind of look through, and that kind of reflects the overall, um, plan that was presented here today. Commissioner Eggers. Um, <clears throat> Megan, um, you know, we uh, we kind of got behind on sidewalk stuff, and we've made some real improvements this past year on, on, on that. And so the question really comes to the our sewer lines and relining those. I, I remember when first came on in like, you know, six years ago, seven years ago, they said that we were really behind. How are we doing on the relining to the same of the, some of the stuff that you talked about, you know, keeping the water, uh, the wastewater in the pipes and not on the streets. How are we doing on that side of it? And can we accelerate that any faster? We can, and I know that we have been bringing a number of lining projects to you uh, for approval in specific areas that have been identified. But going back to the part of the private sewer lateral policy is a find and fix program, which incorporates public and private lining, and that is being designed to accelerate in specific areas that we're seeing issues. So those areas have been identified. There's six areas, 
And what we'll be doing, instead of taking a piecemeal approach to just doing, you know, a lining project here and there and, and separating them out, we're going to be doing a neighborhood-wide approach and actually all six areas under one umbrella. So we're going to be looking at a design build method of project delivery for that particular project. So that will expedite the project and it will also allow us to incorporate public outreach into the project so that it's consistent as well as performance measures. So looking at pre and post monitoring. So that will rapidly accelerate uh, the lining project and that design criteria package is being completed right now. So it should yeah. be advertised. Yeah, I think that outreach that you're talking about is going to be so important. Yes. Um, and that's the way we should do it. Kind of an encouragement, right? We're not forcing people to do this. We're trying to say, hey, we're in, we're going to be in your area. Right. Costs. It is going to, it will be volunteer based. Right. So we're going to be getting voluntary right of access, you know, temporary construction easements to the property. But I kind of, and that's actually one of the most critical components is public participation in the program. Um, I, I kind of joke with my team that, you know, if somebody knocks on your door, a stranger knocks on your door and offers you something free at your house. My first thing is like, no, go away. I don't care what it is. Just get away. <laughs> Are you going to rob me? You know, you don't trust people to come on your property and do things. I mean, we're going to we're going to test their water softener for and, them. And <laughs> right. So it's just, we've got to overcome that barrier. And hopefully as a county, you know, we, we have a name for ourselves that we are, you know, part of the county. But we will be strategically working with community groups, too, to get the word out in advance so that they can talk to the neighborhood and kind of get that, get that message out there that this is not punitive. This is something we're coming in to do as part of an overall system project and that you will get personal benefit from it because if you have a damaged lateral it could collapse and it could you know cause significant damage to your home and, and expense to you personally so it, it, it's absolutely one of the most critical components of the find and fix is the public outreach and we'll be doing it by areas so so yes. we have that, that specific cost. defined areas yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you for the questions discussion all right, thank you very much. If you agree, we can move to solid waste, try to knock that out before um, lunchtime. I think that's the way to go. <clears throat> so good morning again, commissioners. I'm Chris Rose, your budget director. I am also the budget analyst for solid waste. I will be presenting along with Paul Sacco uh, and, and potentially his team. Okay, good. Um, and I will, I will introduce uh, <coughs> Director Sacco and Cassandra Hartman. Do I have it right? Good. Okay. Thank you. Um, she's a good partner with us. She she does their finances at Solid Waste. And Jackie's going to be coming back in a minute to do the CIP portion of Solid Waste since it is an enterprise fund as well. Um, so I'm going to start right on page one and, and move through. Uh, it's not 95 pages in this case. It's 24 pages. So uh, we'll, we'll head right into it. Uh, we're not going to read every department purpose, but this one I'd like to read because it's, it's, it really captures what the department's doing. The Department of Solid Waste administers and manages solid waste disposal services for Pinellas County citizens and businesses in a safe, sustainable, and cost-efficient manner. Uh, it's a good, succinct, straightforward purpose statement, why they exist, why they're here. Um, I'm going to move into topics of discussion, and I, I'm going to take just a point of personal privilege. I used to work in solid waste at, at one of my last uh, jobs, and I, I love solid waste, so I jumped at the chance when, when this one came open as a, a chance to be their budget analyst. Um, so... Topics of discussion. We do have uh, some true budget issues that, that we're going to put before you uh, to think about. The first one uh, right there, the first topic of discussion is the Waste Energy Service Fee Agreement is currently under renegotiation with Covanta. Uh, and depending on how those negotiations go, it could change some of the expenses uh, going forward. Um, we don't have a, a time frame exactly on when the negotiations will be done, but it is something just to consider as we move forward. 
Next up, uh, as you are all aware, uh, due to changes in state law, the power of purchase agreement is going to uh, expire in December of 24. This is something we're looking toward and planning for. Uh, it, is, uh, it will cause a sharp decrease in the revenues for solid waste starting in fiscal year 25 uh, and continuing in those years following. And, and just so we're clear, uh, that, that revenue source is about 55% of solid waste total revenues. So just, again, not something that needs a decision necessarily at this point, but it is something coming that we want to keep in mind for the future. And then uh, the last topic of discussion that I want to put in front of you is the department during the pandemic uh, moved towards electronic and contactless payments. Uh, and, and it has been good. There's been a lot of um, uh, budgetary impacts and non-budgetary impacts associated with that. Um, it is, of course, safer for both our customers and our, our employees, but it has also lowered costs overall. It is uh, less expensive to not handle cash. It just is. And, and we're seeing that uh, in, in several other areas. Uh, utilities was actually one we're looking at as well, that, that some of those things have occurred. You already heard about the electronic payment possibilities there. Um, quicker transactions and, and more accounts being on the books. So it, it does benefit the, the users as well, the patrons of solid waste. So it, it, it's good all around. Those are the topics of discussion. I, I will... Uh, I will move. I'm going to jump ahead in a minute, but there might be a question. Yeah, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask the question because I've been approached, I don't want to say a half a dozen times, but approaching that by people who still have a problem with the fact that they can't pay cash. And it seems like a, you know, a system that's set up for convenience, set up for all the things that you talked about, and yet we're a government agency that should take cash at some point. So I was wondering, like, is there a way that people can prepay an account in cash so that when they go to some, you know, they're coming in to dump their waste, their, their, you know, and, and they, have a, they have a credit on their account that they've paid in cash ahead of time and they can just work against that um, instead of having to deal with uh, some other transaction? Some. Yeah, so Commissioner, answer your question. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we offer accounts uh, to all our customers. Uh, for sure, we have municipal customers, our private haulers, businesses. Um, usually the, the uh, feedback that we get on the cash system is typically what we call our mom and pops. They're the folks that don't come regularly, which we understand. Um, but they're very few in number. And when you look at the number of transactions that we uh, encounter every day and then the number of, of volume that we we take in every day. It's a very small number, and there are options, like you said, either open an account with us, or they can go and they can have like a, a prepaid debit card or something along those lines. Yeah, I, 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 I take your comment about there's very few of them. Seems like we ought to be able to accommodate them. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, it would be nice to get that out there so folks like just like they have that option. Um, Again, not a big deal, apparently. We don't have that many of them, so it shouldn't be that big of a deal for us to accommodate them as well. So that's just my thought. The, the issue of handling cash, especially at places where you don't have large volumes, is a significant policy issue. Um, it really is, because you have to have set up a, a system. You have to have uh, armored cars come and pick up cash. You have to transact that. You have to audit that. Um, and so it, it is very expensive to handle cash, especially in an area where you have very few. And so with the invent and, you know, grandma now has a debit card, right? And, and so, you know, we, we, you know, so we do have some that don't, you know, um, and, and there's, there's other options like that. We're, we are trying to evaluate that though. And so I, I, I wanted to take the opportunity to say, we're looking at this kind of countywide, you know, think about some of the other places that, that you, you see that. And even like in Megan, um, shop of whether they take in cash or whether, you know, you uh, we kind of outsource that out and you can pay it at, you know, Walgreens where they're already handling cash or, you know, some other method. Um, and so we're trying to evaluate that because we want it to be convenient for our customer. We need to make sure that's available. And especially those that are critical services, like you don't have a choice with water and sewer. Um, 
So, but it's it, it is kind of a big deal because you got to you got to set up the system if you're going to handle it, regardless of whether you have one transaction or you know thousands of transactions in a day. And um, that's the difficulty that we're and and it's a judge you know it's it's really a judgment call, um, but we are looking at it. I you know and, and Commissioner Eggers raised that issue. We did go back and talk to staff about that and um, and and are kind of evaluating and looking at that. So I'm going to jump to page two. I'll come back to page one in a minute, but I'm going to jump to the top of page two uh, and go through a quick budget summary with you. Uh, the the write-up at the top of page two is borne out in the tables at the bottom of page two and the top of page three. So just to hit the highlights, uh, the revenue for solid waste is increasing, 11.6 million or 7.6 percent. Uh, the the main components of these are the tipping fees, the electrical capacity, and the electrical sales. So we've already addressed uh, briefly capacity and and sales of electricity at the plant, and what might happen in fiscal year 25 associated with that. Um, I'm going to hold on on uh, the fees in just a minute. I want to come back to it. But the tipping fees are, are changing in the recommendation and in the, uh, the amount. There, there is also uh, an amount of uh, tonnage coming in that we're looking at. Going to paragraph two there, other miscellaneous revenue categories uh, it is increasing uh, $250,000, and this is mainly associated with the renewable energy credits that solid waste has been putting out there. And uh, we, we budgeted very conservatively for that revenue going into the current fiscal year, and we're realizing a higher amount of revenue next year. So it's something that we are addressing actually in the budget this next time as higher revenues. On to page, uh, paragraph three. Still on page two, uh, you'll see that the expenditure budget, net of reserves, is decreasing, uh, $2.9 million. The major piece of that is not truly a reduction. It's just moving uh, a, a couple of capital projects out to capital. They had been shown in the operating budget, and we're showing them in the capital budget now, uh, the biggest one being structural steel out there at the plant. And, uh, and so it's a change, but a change on, on both sides of the ledger. And then uh, personnel services, as Commissioner Eggers asked earlier, uh, we do have the 3% built in uh, at the time being uh, for raises, uh, but it is really offset by a reduction of two FTEs in solid waste. So the increase in personnel services is only $42,000. And the reason is because they're being more efficient at solid waste. And so we've offset the majority of that increase going forward. You can see it all in the tables there at the bottom of two and the top of three. And then we could go into the programs uh, on page three and page four. Uh, you can see each of those, uh, how we've broken out each of those expenses. Now I'm going to jump back to page one, if I may, and talk at the bottom of page one about user fees. Uh, we have built into this budget a 6.8% increase to, uh, to our tipping fees at solid waste. Uh, this is what was brought to you uh, back on April 21st, and that is the recommendation that we have built into the solid waste budget. And you can see the, the impacts of it down there. There is a public hearing coming before you on June 21st, coming up next, so that you can see that uh, in front of you at that time. That's when the decision will be made. I am going to turn the floor. Yes. Sorry. Um, Mr. Eggers. Yeah, on that same, it was showing municipal solid waste. That it shows an increase um, and then the revenue impact. Um, and I, there's there's a change in the commercial side and no revenue impact. I was just... Could, could it's just the way we're showing it. We're not sure where the tonnages are going to be, so we're showing the impact all in the top line. Uh, we expect oh. it, it's more okay. of a, an expedient way so of showing it. So. It's not really zeros. It's just no, all of those are the $3 million. Yes, sir. 
three million two. Yeah. Um, a basis for that increase, other than I guess cost of goods sold, but is it comparative to other? Or how are we? Comp we did this, I think, once before. Showed us that we did. Yeah. Uh, and so we're we're in line. So uh, back on April twenty first, you had Raftelis come to you right. and show you how right. they went through the steps to get to that fee increase. Uh, that is the recommendation from our thank outside you. consultant. And th and thank you for reminding me of that, yeah. and I think it's important that our, our residents hear that too. Apparently, it was important that I hear it again, so, <laughs> but uh, for th them as well. Thank you. Yes, sir. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Director Sacco and let him go through accomplishments, performance, and work plan. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, before I jump into that, I just want to echo a little bit what Chris said as far as budget goes. Um, you know, as discussed with, with the county administration and also OMB, you know, realizing that the power purchase agreement is going away, you know, the onus is on us to look for every opportunity to increase revenues, reduce our costs so that there's confidence before we do any kind of right, rate hike uh, or request for a rate hike, um, that we're doing everything that we can in that, in that area. Oftentimes we get asked, usually by TMC members, about our reserves. You know, we have a very healthy reserve, but the reserves that we have really are going to be part of the rate stabilization as we help flatten that curve in, in conjunction with the, the rate increases that are going to be requested at uh, next week's um, public hearing. And also the monies in there are to help with our long-term landfill obligation that we're required to with FDEP. Um, it also covers the CIP projects that have been built into this budget uh, that has come out of the 30-year master plan. And then really long-term, we have to continue to put money in the reserves for the next go-around whenever we want to do any kind of reinvestment or renewable replacement projects at the waste energy facility. With the master plan's goal of uh, zero waste to landfill by 2050, the waste energy facility is certainly the best vehicle uh, process, if you would, to reduce what is going into that landfill. So we need to continue to put money in the reserves to make sure that it's healthy enough to uh, extend the life of that at that facility, you know, at that time, probably in 25 or 30 years. So I just wanted to share the confidence that we have in the budget and that we're doing everything that we can to identify those revenues and reduce costs as we move forward. For accomplishments for FY22, um, obviously these aren't all the accomplishments. We've kind of just highlighted and outlined those that we thought would be, you know, to share, important enough to share with you today. We did finish up a project that would look at using uh, or reusing the ash that's coming out of the waste energy facility instead of just using it for landfill cover as we do traditionally now. Um, it is great cover, but sometimes we do have extra ash that we may have to, you know, wait until we use. Sometimes we don't have enough ash in some, in some uh, uh, courses of the year, and we have to use yard waste sometimes or even a blend. But what we wanted to really look at was using our, our, our ash and construct blocks, if you would, think almost like a cinder block because the ash is almost like that material, mm -hmm. and create vertical walls on our landfill as opposed to the slope that you would see. And by creating those walls, it would give you more airspace and put, be able to put more in that landfill and effectively extend the life of the landfill without really expanding your footprint of the landfill. So what we found with that study is it, it's, it's a good idea. It is possible. It's just not possible on the active landfill that we're at today because the foundations of that landfill just have not been uh, constructed originally to support those type of blocks to go straight up. So while we may not do that in the active side on the, on the, on the west side of 28th Street, we still have the sod farm, which is our, uh, you know, expansion area for landfill, you know, probably 20 or 30 years down the road. But we do know when we get into that side, we would construct that facility with that type of foundation so that we can maximize, you know, the airspace and look at vertical, cons vertical construction of the walls at that time. So a worthwhile study is just not something that we can enact right now, but we will shelve it. And, and like I said, we'll pull that out later, probably for a director way past my time. Um, but hopefully somebody will remember that it's on the shelf. Um, second bullet there, we are the state leader in recycling for the sixth consecutive year. Um, something that we're proud of, but you know, I do that tongue in cheek and it's something that we not always have a whole lot of control of. You know, we do what we can in recycling outreach. We work hard with our programs. You know, we have our, our uh, Pinellas partners in recycling meetings, which have really gained traction. Um, so it's not just Pinellas. We get neighboring 
uh, uh, regional counties that attend. We have FDEP that attends, businesses that attend. So we really work hard in the areas of glass, contracts, um, and, 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 and just trying to keep moving that ball forward in that, in that area. What we're finding is the most uh, biggest variable in, in the recycled materials in Pinellas. And you gotta realize 50% of traditionally of what is created in Pinellas is being recycled. If we weren't doing that and it was coming to the facility, almost all that would be going into landfill. So be proud, be very proud of the 50% that we do recycle and we'd like to continue to inch that closer. That 50% also allows us to get what's called a waste energy credit. There's a threshold that FDE puts out that when you reach 50%, we can get up to a 25% waste energy credit, which puts us into the 75, 76% range, which kind of propels us to being a leader. So there is credit for you know, having a waste energy facility in the eyes of, of FDEP. Um, but the variable in the, in the recycling area that most don't understand is the amount of construction debris that is leaving the county. Whether that is recycled in the county or leaves the county for uh, recycling or more importantly, if it goes to a landfill, we still get charged for that because we're the county where that was initially you know, created. And when that leaves the county, we kind of lose control of what's being recycled and what's not. So our team, we've been looking at that for the last couple of years and we're trying to reach out to those, I'll call them recyclers or reprocessors of that and really try to understand what's going on with their processes and offer opportunities for them to look at recycling as opposed to landfilling uh, there. So we're gonna be you know, re uh, recircling our efforts and trying to do something better uh, as we move forward through the end of 22 and into 23. Paul, uh, Commissioner Long has a question. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Paul, for your, all those comments about the recycling issue, which I am very, very much in favor of. So my question is, you know those um, big bins that you have all over the county where you take your recycling materials and put them in there? If there's a community that has, let's say, three to 500 people living in it, and they want to have one of those recycling bins next to their waste management big blue thing, what's the process for getting one of those? We, well, we would need to first determine if it's in a municipal area or unincorporated. If it's in a municipal area, we would turn them towards that municipality and, and have that discussion. If it's an unincorporated area, unincorporated areas, right now, the only recycling areas that, that we have established are in the parks or in our park beaches. We have not done community areas, and nor do I think we've been approached to do that. So if, if someone's interested in that, I would say that we would evaluate that and entertain that. I don't know if that's something we would do, but I would say that's something that we could look at. But I don't recall, in my, since I've been in solid waste, ever having a discussion with a community that's been interested in doing that. So if I may. Yes, ma'am. Um, Mr. Chair. So. Let's pretend it's a municipality. It's within a municipality then. So the city has to make arrangements with you? Not with us. It would be with them. The city does their own recycling collection. So they would just work with the city to set up. If the city offers that service, that's what I'm saying. No, I but I mean, who, who somebody, somebody from your area, don't those bins come from your area? No, ma'am. They don't? Recy no. So the recyclables on the municipal side is strictly controlled and managed and marketed through the municipalities. Um, we, we are not in the recycling game except for the unincorporated areas. One of the studies that we looked at is trying to address and work with the city regarding recycling and, and having a, a regional facility or, you know, shipping it. And um, that's, that's in discussion. But currently, it resides within the municipalities. Oh, that's very, very interesting. Thank you so much for that information. Stay tuned. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, the next bullet under accomplishments is first metal cleaning. And I think I, I, I hit on this the last time I, I spoke with you. But um, the metals that come out of our waste energy facility are usually laden with an ash. And there is a value on, on those metals at that point, but what we have found that 
if you clean those metals before you send them to market, it's probably four to five times more valuable. And the cost to clean them may be one time the cost. So, you know, it may be 20 some dollars a ton to clean those metals, but we may get over $100 a ton right now with the market to make that happen. Otherwise, we'd only be getting maybe $20 a ton for the metals. That work has been done traditionally in Pasco County, uh, operated by Covanta, who is the, also the operator of our facility. And the regional waste energy facilities would take their metals to Pasco. So we would truck our metals up to Pasco. It would be cleaned and any residual materials had to come back to the county. So we were paying for transportation up and back. I think PASCO had some space needs and asked Covanta to relocate. And we talked with Covanta, and since we're the largest waste energy facility in the region, we talked with them and we reached an agreement for them to locate at solid waste and set up shop there, which really saves us the cost of the transportation of those materials, which actually increases our, our net revenue for uh, the metals going out. So an opportunity where we actually get revenue for being a host, we get a host fee, and then we also increase the, the, the net revenue that we would see for our metal. So overall, we're probably seeing in the neighborhood of three hundred and fifty dollars to $400,000 more a year just by hosting that at our site. So again, we're looking at every opportunity to find revenues. That one kind of dropped in our lap and we just ran and tried to make that one happen. So we're, we're happy and they just started up literally last month. So, uh, so far, so good. And then the, uh, the last bullet there, uh, on, on page uh, four is the renewable energy credits. So we've been looking at this for quite a while, but we really didn't know how to get started. And we didn't know of any waste energy facilities that were really in this game. Uh, and so we, we, we hired one of our consultants to help us with this. And what we found is that for every megawatt that's generated at the waste energy facility equals one energy credit. And we could put them on the open market. And there's a process that we needed to go through to go uh, to a uh, almost like a broker that actually puts them on the market. And then you have brokers that would take what's there and they have customers that want to buy energy credits similar to what you would see with tree mitigation credits and, and things that are out there for other environmental uh, credits that are available. So what we found is when we got on the market, they gave us credit for up to two years. So we were able to go back to 2019 and sell these credits. And we found that those credits had a cost of maybe 25 to 30 cents per credit. And the older they are, they're not as valuable. But as we found as we move forward, the most recent sale of our credits were probably pushing 75 cents a credit. So every year, I think we, we budgeted around 45 or 50 cents a credit. It's probably 250 to $300,000 a year that we would expect in energy credits. But to date, it's been close to 500,000 that we received from 2019 through 2021, um, which again was found money for us. Um, and again, a new source of revenue that we'll continue to, to explore. Um, and the more competitive that this market becomes, the more valuable these credits will become. So we're hopeful that that, that continues. So, and then the last bullet there, it really doesn't affect our revenues, it really affect our expenses, it really affects our operation. Uh, we have an NPDES permit, which is required for, you know, any business, any government facility for stormwater, surface water, or whatnot, if anything is discharged, you know, into, into, the, into the waterways or, or bays or whatnot. Uh, we have worked hard with FDEP, um, and we're actually asking that that permit be rescinded. And there's just some things that we need to do process-wise to, to make that happen. We're in the throes of working with FDEP now. One of the biggest is that we have a wastewater facility on site that treats both the leachate and surface water, which are mixed. And we treat that water and prepare it and send it to our waste energy facility where it's used as makeup water for the cooling tower. So almost all the water on our site is treated through evaporation, um, which is healthy. Now we'll get some, you know, um, contaminant water that would go back into our pond, and we'll start that process over again because we get new waters coming in and it continues to dilute and around and around we go. But we don't, and we haven't discharged offsite, I'm gonna say probably since 2020, I think was the last storms that we had. So we're designed for a 100 year plane. 
we've done a lot with our, our, our wastewater treatment facility in that we've almost doubled our capacity through the use of different chemicals and then some mechanical changes that have been, that have been made. So we're, our confidence is high that we can, we can do this in the eyes of FDEP, they've been watching us um, before I think they'll pull the trigger and say we don't need this permit going forward. But we see it as accomplishment right now and how we're, we're operating and it certainly is a sustainable uh, form of leachate treatment. Other facilities, landfills, will send that down the, the sewer and the utilities department would have to, to treat that. And if we were to send the amounts that we're talking about down to you know, the city of St. Pete or um, you know, to uh, South Cross, it would probably overrun their facility just with the volume of water. So it's best that we do what we do and how we do it. So questions on any of the accomplishments before I get into the performance metrics? Questions? So I'll bounce through the metrics uh, pretty fast. So waste to energy, you know, the largest that we look at is really the availability of, this, of, the, of the facility. And we're right now probably close to 95 or 96 percent available when you look at a 12-month rolling average, which is how Duke Energy looks at us for the payment of our capacity payment. And the lowest point that we could be is, is 70 percent. If we drop below 70, we wouldn't get our capacity payment. Now, we haven't, we were, we were close to that in the high 70s back when, you know, a previous operator was here. Um, but the, the infusion of, of CIP monies to, to renew that facility and extend its life, it's running better than it has when it was brand new. Um, so it's something very to be proud of. Uh, the reason that that 95% is even more important is because when our power purchase agreement ends, we'll be, the option, the most attractable, attractive option right now is the standard offer that comes from Duke Energy which requires a 90% availability. Now we'll look at trying to negotiate that down maybe to something that's closer to 80 or 85, but 90% is a pretty high number to achieve for a, a power plant. I mean, um, we could probably do that for some time, but as this facility ages, it's gonna become more, more and more difficult unless you put more infusion of monies in to make that happen earlier than what you would normally do to extend the life of the facility. So. Well that number is a good number to be tracking. And what was the low point as far as the recession? I mean, that was kind of how we tracked it before was w w more based on economics and what people were buying and throwing away and that kind of thing. Well, that was more of volume coming to the facility, not necessarily the availability of the facility. The facility was available. Oh. It was a little bit less, well, it was probably 10% less than what we'd see today because we were making improvements and we were having to shut the facility down to make those improvements. But we did see, you know, volumes shift, you know, during the recession. They went way down. Um, we thought we would see something similar to that with, with uh, COVID, but that wasn't the case. More people were at home, and we saw a shift from business waste to residential waste. So it almost balanced out. But what we have seen over the last two years, the volumes have gone up year over year, and we believe that's really attributed to the tourism numbers that we're seeing in the county. You know, it's not population. It's, it's very little would be based on population, but we are seeing a lot from the tourism that's, that's driving those numbers. Um, I really talked about the traditional recycling rate already when I talked about um, leading the state. The projected life of the landfill, um, we look at this because this is really what's marking our progress when we look at the master plan with zero waste the landfill by 2050. We want that number to be going up over time, but it's going to be kind of a, a spiky, you know, looking number until we can do something really physical to our waste flow. And that's going to come in the form of either removing organics from our waste energy facility so we can inject our bulky waste into the facility, which would reduce bulky waste that's going to the landfill. Uh, we can be looking at our organics either in anaerobic digestion or what we really hope for is teaming up with, with Megan and her team with utilities to do the, the uh, RRF facility, which would be able to take our uh, probably commercial organics, maybe some of our yard waste and possibly some of our tires um, into her facility, which again would relieve pressure on our waste energy facility and allow us to divert what's going to the landfill either by volume or by bulky waste into the facility. So it's an important number that we track. The contamination rate, important in a sense that if we get into our recycling game, whether we're gonna be 
operating a MRF or even if we're looking at some type of you know, uh, countywide recycling and working with a private processor, contamination is a big deal. Um, and it, it has certainly heightened when, you know, China kind of dropped out of taking the, uh, the recycled materials from, from the U.S. And, and other nations of the world. So we need to get that and keep that contamination rate to what I believe is an industry accepted average of 20%. There are others that are much higher than that. Um, we're lucky in a sense that we're below that right now, and I think through continued outreach and uh, if we get into an, an, a uh, countywide uh, recycling mode, I think enforcement would help play a little bit more, and I don't mean enforcement in such a way of fines, but actually being out there and helping to educate the public more, you know, actually at the curbside to kind of make some of those things happen. And then the last one that we track is our business waste assessment group, which goes out and inspects businesses and educates them on how to uh, better manage their waste. Um, we've had a turn down with the number of inspections that we've been able to do with COVID because we just couldn't interface with the businesses. We've been impacted by the Great Recession. We've just actually in the last two months, actually in the last month, have finally gotten fully staffed in that operation to get out there and full bore make our assessments with a goal of hitting about 20% of our businesses a year um, so that we're touching each business every five years, which is what the state requires in this unfunded mandate. What this measure is, is, is tracking is to go, when we go back to that business, we're trying to measure how effective our communication was and look at the effectiveness to see, you know, that they're not having more non-compliance issues or whatnot. So it, it just measures the effectiveness of that group that's going out there and, and making that happen. So they're kind of the, the high level measures that we have. We certainly have more at a lower level, but we thought these were the most important to, to share with the board. So are there questions with that? Mr. Agers, just one question. Um, <clears throat> whether it's a, a MRF facility, which you're gonna talk about here in a little bit, or um, a larger um, sludge treatment facility. Uh, we have we have room for those. Whether we do it or not, so no, we have room down in our facilities down there too. So we've uh, already we've already identified the, uh, the sludge. Well, I call it the bio yeah. bio solid municipal waste treatment combined. Uh, we have a, a site already uh, picked out on the solid waste property for for that to occur. Uh, the MRF facility. We believe we have room to make that happen, or it may be something adjacent, or it may be something in the area. Since it's recycled materials, it doesn't have to be at our solid waste permanent facility. Um, but we gotta be careful that we probably don't wanna be out buying new property either. So we would do all that we can to site it on our property. The other bit of discussion that goes along with that is if the, the, the cities or municipalities that are far away, if we got into a, a uh, you know, all-encompassing countywide recycling program, we may be forced into looking about a transfer station or something because it's a long drive for the recyclable routes that they may or may not be making today, which is why we're in the midst of, of talking with the municipalities and the privates to make that happen. Some of the privates have transfer stations, so it depends on who would be interested to be in that game. If, if nothing and we got into that game totally, then we may be working with a municipality and or looking for a, a, an opportunity for a transfer station elsewhere, most likely up north in the North County area. Yeah, somehow, somehow they, 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 they do now travel a lot further. Um, some, you know, there's that cost that we can recoup somehow. Right. Um, okay, thank you. Commissioner Seal. I guess I'm a little bit disturbed about that we're going to shift to incinerating electronics. Because I mean, it was our goal for a long time as part of recycling was actually to recycle those. No other options at this point? Well, what we found, Commissioner, I mean, we're in the midst right now of, of sol soliciting feedback. We've talked to our municipal partners, we've talked to our private uh, haulers, and we've actually held a virtual meeting with the public. We had our first public meeting on Monday night. We have two more planned for this month in Mid-County and, and, and North County. But what we have found is that the electronics have just, they've just changed. We don't have the, the cathode ray tubes that we've, we've seen before. 
And the most recycled materials that are coming out of these electronics are the metals that we're able to recover through waste energy. And you know, a, a byproduct of this is really personal information. You know, when this information comes to us in these materials, we can't guarantee the safety of those. We're, I'm not gonna say we can going forward for sure, but it would be segregate, segregated and then moved right up to the waste energy facility for incineration. What we, what we can ensure is if it comes to us, it would be segregated, go to waste energy facility and not go to the landfill. There's a lot of electronics that end up in a trash can and could be landfilled if we're in a diversion mode now. We would rather them make the decision to either put it in their, in their waste container or if they had to bring it to us, the most important thing would be, or the best thing would be to take it back to take back centers or, or whatnot that we offer. And that's on our site. We have the where do you, where do you go tool you know, to, for our, our public or businesses to go look and, and, and see where they can take these materials. We're, we're the last resort. I mean, when it comes to us, we're looking at it as disposal and then we look at it as a resource before anything goes into the landfill. So right now I would say that is the best opportunity. When you look at the tonnages, we would, what we're seeing is about 7,000 tons total a year of electronics that would probably be incinerated as opposed to uh, being recycled. And you know, just for the public, we, we, we take in probably 1.2 to 1.4 ton, million tons a year. So it's, 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 a, it's a small number, but we feel confident that we're getting the metals out and that is the most important you know, uh, materials that would be recycled out of our electronics today. So we've already talked about the second bullet there, and we've really talked about the MRF. If you want to know more about that, I'd be happy to share, um, but that's up, up to you. So the MRF, just the status there, um, you know, since we've last, we've last talked, we've been asked to go back out to the private processors, engage their capacity and ability to um, participate in, in a countywide program for the amount of recycled materials that are currently being collected today, which is around 65,000 tons. Um, we had our meeting with the processors in late May. Uh, we had four or five on the phone. We had a follow-up call with a processor that owns a, a MRF in Sarasota that would possibly could be interested in purchasing a new MRF and wanted to know if we'd be you know, interested if that was a submittal that was being made. We said absolutely, because if we're not happy with the processors and we had to get into that game, we would be on that same time frame if we had to build a MRF. So we would entertain almost anybody that'd be willing to submit and then we would evaluate based on, on what is being submitted. So we took the information that we got from, from the, the private processors, we incorporated that into our MRF outline that has just been sent literally on Monday back to our municipal partners with a request to get that information back at the end of June. We would hope to be working with uh, purchasing to put meat on, meat on the bones for that portion of the RFP, add it to their boilerplate and get that out in the August timeframe with a 60 to 90 day turnaround for an evaluation, which is what we've been on the schedule for all along as far as fall and getting an answer back on whether the privates are gonna be a player or not in this game. And if not, then we would move forward to uh, look at getting a, a consultant on board to look at the feasibility design and then construction of a facility which is probably a three to four year process. At the private MRFs, what are they producing with the recycled materials? Are they producing any product or are they just? They're just the processors of the recyclables. So all the collections that are being made curbside and in some businesses are going to the private processors. They run it through their, their MRF stream. What's come out is se segregated into you know, all the, the the marketing material or the materials that can be marketed for recycling. And then they have recycled partners that they actually ship those materials to. So the processors don't do anything with the materials other than send them to recyclable or recycled manufacturers that actually do something with those products. Are they giving you any feedback as to how the recyclable market is at this point? Right now it's mixed, um, but it has been up compared to where we've been the last two or three years. Mm -hmm. What I try to share with the, the municipals are, you know, recycling comes at a cost. 
Um, and sometimes it's more costly than it is, than it would be to bring it to us. But if you were to bring it to us, we would be landfilling it, it's, which is gonna end up costing them much more money in the long run because if our landfill fills up, we're gonna be shipping this stuff out of county and instead of paying what we are now on the 40 to $50 range, you'll probably be paying over $100 for everything. And if you're paying $90 or $100 to recycle a smaller amount, that's a much better call. And we may be able to get that into a smaller number, you know, if we do this with some type of, you know, uh, volumetric economy in, in doing it, you know, in, in, as a countywide program. So they understand that. They, they haven't made much noise. I'd say they being the municipals haven't made much noise about not wanting to be in the recycling game anymore. Um, you know, county administrators have done a great job in, in bringing them together and, and, and talking them through that. Um, we're just trying to move this process as long as fast as we can so that we're able to, you know, meet their needs. And, and as long as the markets remain good, it's not really as big a pressure. It's when the markets tank that it becomes more and more a pressure. But they, they really can't look at recyclables as being a moneymaker or a revenue generator. It's going to always be a cost. And if they get money back because the markets are good, then you know enjoy that when it happens, but it's not gonna be all the time. It's always gonna be based typically on what oil prices are traditionally, and that's just a cyclical market. Commissioner Long. Okay, so I promised myself I was not gonna say this until the very end of our budget workshops. Which is next Friday. But I cannot not, I can, thank you. But given your comments today, Paul, and this is not personal about you, it's indicative of the last several people that have presented to us. I heard you say that recycling was always gonna come at a cost. And not one time in any of your comments did you talk about the importance of the resiliency and sustainability effort that recycling becomes a very positive thing in terms of taking care of our trash? Um, given all the conversations that we've had about our strategies, how important this is for the future, I just find it astounding that it's not anywhere in your language, verbal language, or written in the documents. And that really brings my bell in not a good way. And I want to, I'm going to step in because I did hear Paul say it saves landfill costs in the future. And that is But equals he didn't mention the word sustainability no, he, and resiliency. He didn't mention it, but that is what it translates into. We'll, we'll try to get staff <laughs> saying sustainability and resiliency, and but, okay? But, but, he was, but that's exactly what he was talking about. Yeah. That's what we've been working with municipalities on. When this started, we had municipalities saying, should we cancel our recycling contracts? Should we tell our residents just to put it in the trash? That's how this initiative began. Because it, right now, the municipalities do their own thing on recycling. So we started it with that end in mind. And it was an education piece that Paul and I had to start up to say, yeah, if, if one person does it, but if everybody does it, one, you, let's, let's look at the long-term cost. Let's look at the long-term impact to not only our environment, um, and, but also financially the impact of that. And it was through that education process that everybody came together and we started looking at ways of working together on recycling. And so it is a sustainability issue, um, maybe not in the, in the words that we're using, but that's exactly the reason the initiative began. I appreciate your comments, Barry. My point is we're trying to change a culture here in terms of how people think. And you have to use the right language to really make it powerful and meaningful. Well, our sustainability initiative with recycling is, is working and we're getting there. How about Thank that? you, there you go. <laughs> That's what I wanna hear. Thank you. All right, Paul, you done? Are we ready to hear capital? I'm, yes. What about lunch? After, <laughs> after capital. Yep, this will be quick. 
Um, the Solid Waste Capital Improvement Program is comprised of two programs, recycling and education, and site operational programs. The, most of the projects you'll see are in the site operational program. Um, there are actually no projects past next year in recycling and education. Those projects will have been completed, and the uh, further recycling and education outreach is within the operating budget. Um, the FY22 estimate and the proposed six-year plan for recycling and education is a million dollars. Uh, that's basically next year, and for the site operational program is 191 million. Those amounts do not include reserves. That is just um, the project's budgets. Those details for each project begin on page 15 if you want to see project by project. Uh, their proposed CIP is balanced throughout the forecasted plan. The CIP six-year plan does include some increased funding for existing projects and several new projects. Um, those um, begin on page 19, and again, those are included to provide transparency of what's been added to the plan. Uh, there are only three projects and their program projects that required that increased funding justification. Um, and program projects are projects that are budgeted at a higher level, and then you do various sub-projects throughout the year. The three that they had were pavement replacement, uh, the landfill miscellaneous projects, and the waste to energy uh, discretionary force majeure work. That particular work is, um, those are projects that result from either changes in law or to improve performance or environmental compliance. Um, the new project requests, uh, there are a couple of listed there. Just wanted to mention that our new projects do go through our CIP project portfolio management, and that is a um, several level reviews of staff level at our coordinating committee, our director level at the action team, and the governance committee at the county administrator level. And I would just want to point out that our request form is pretty lengthy, and there is a specific question on sustainability, and they must use the sea level rise tool. Uh, in order to go further on the form. So all of that needs to be addressed to make sure that it is meeting those requirements. Okay. So uh, just a couple of new projects listed there, but again, that's all already included and the forecast is balanced. Mr. Rose. So commissioners, I'm gonna ask you to jump to page 21. Very quickly, we're gonna deal with Lelman Solid Waste, uh, which is a sub subcomponent here of solid waste, but I'll get you out fast. So uh, the, the one thing, the main thing to let you know is that we are recommending that we continue forward with the same rate that we are char charging the residents of Lelman for the collection and disposal of their waste, $16 per month. You can see all of the, the rates uh, in, that, in that area on the very last page, page 24. Uh, but I wanted to get that in front of you because it is a component of this budget that we that we have. And uh, just to let you know, the contractor that we have doing that has not asked for a, a an increase in costs, but it could come. That is one of the things that could happen in, in uh, future years or in future months even. It's possible. Uh, so that could affect our budget as well. And Commissioner Long, in their purpose statement right on the first page of Solid Waste, I read it at the beginning of this presentation. One of their goals is sustainability right there on about the fifth line of the, of the document. So I just want to make sure we are, we are listening to you uh, and, and getting it done. Are there any other questions about solid waste? You know, the, the, I, I forget which area I was in, um, another unincorporated area, and uh, they point to the Lelman model as something, you know, I think you're going to hear conversations from other unincorporated areas as people really getting frustrated with trucks running every day through their neighborhood uh, from a different vendor. Um, and then we've had one vendor that had some major uh, delivery issues uh, recently out in the Gandy area, I think. Um, and so as those kind of things happen more, and then they're going to look around and say, well, why are you doing it for one area? You know, we want the same kind of thing. So just, you know, on the radar kind of stuff. Commissioner Steele. Okay, but I know didn't state law change that? Is it now? Is it seven years? Um, I I know it's a tremendous. Uh, I think it's five to seven years for a notice. Notice. And then if the board was going to enact, we would be liable. I think for up to two or three years of net, you know, <laughs> net profits to these haulers that we would have to pay up front. 
the way the state law is written. So. I know. I remember when they changed that, what a big difference it made to us not being able. I mean, Lillman was a wonderful example of everything coming together. And it's a shame. I won't ask who sponsored that bill. Um, uh, Mr. Rose, uh, what else do you have? I was remiss. I should say we have not changed that rate in five years. So just, just for the, the boards, uh, the, the Lellman rate, the $16 per month, five. Yes, ma'am. But that is the last thing I had forgotten to mention that, so. For the questions, discussion, Mr. Burton, anything else before we take a break? All right, it's uh, 1225, uh, one o'clock. That work for everybody? All right, one o'clock. And we do have lunch? It's ready. Okay.
All right, we'll go ahead and uh, come back to order. Start with item number five, Mr. Burton. Go ahead, Chris. So item number five is the communications budget, and I'm going to introduce Barbara and Yana. They're going to they're gonna go through uh, just as we have all the other departments. So budget analyst first, department director second, and with that, Yana Matiak. Um, hello, my name is Yana Matiuk, and as Chris mentioned, I am the budget analyst for communications. Um, I wanted to thank you very much for the uh, um, opportunity to present the uh, FY23 um, budget proposal for the communications. Um, I will read the department purpose because I do feel that um, the uh, message is really strong. Uh, and with that, the Department of Communications manages daily long-term and emergency public communication to help the county empower residents and partners with important and reliable information. I do feel it's a very strong message that uh, the department is sending. Um, with that, moving into the topics for discussion, uh, together with the budget summary, uh, because one feeds off the other one. <clears throat> so the total FY23 budget request for the department is roughly $3 million, with $2.8 million um, being in personnel cost. Um, thus, the personnel services represents 975 uh, of the overall budget increase for FY23. Um, with the cost of the personal services increasing annually, um, and the department facing the need to repurpose a position to accommodate the loss of the budget oversight uh, from the OMB's reorg. Um, the department anticipates the ability to offset the increase in personal services uh, with the decrease in operating expenditures uh, much more difficult in the future years. And this is something that we will need to take into consideration going forward. Um, operating expenses for the department are increasing roughly um, $20,000 or 8.9%. And this is mainly because of the computer um, purchases moving from the capital outlay to the operating um, due to the uh, threshold increase of the um, capital purchases. And this is the directive from the clerk's office. Um, and it's going from $1,000 to $5,000. If it was not for that change, the operating expenditures were, uh, would have been relatively flat and the increase would have been in the capital outlay. Um, and this is because of the, again, computer purchases and this is something that the department, is, um, the, the department uh, plans for um, because the computers are on the annual refreshment um, plan. And with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Barbara for the accomplishments. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about our department. I am Barbara Hernandez, Director of Communications, and I am very pleased and excited to lead a team of uh, 26 total FTEs in uh, making sure that our residents have important information. Um, <clears throat> I am uh, particularly proud of the work our team has done this year coming out of the uh, primarily COVID response. Um, <clears throat> there were a lot of projects and a lot of things that had to be put on hold because of the pandemic response and um, they did not miss a, miss a beat. Um, there are several things that I am extremely proud of that I thought I'd touch on a very high level. Um, first and foremost, um, we've taken this year as a, an opportunity to reconnect a lot with our community on topics other than COVID. So we've been doing a lot of work uh, with the unincorporated areas, Palm Harbor, Lailman, uh, Danceville, Ridge, Crest. Uh, you'll, rec you'll recall several of the historical marker dedication events, uh, our work together on farm share and other food distribution events, um, as uh, well as the graphic design work, which was critical uh, to public works application and uh, uh, also receiving the Joe's Grant, the Joe's Creek Grant. Um, we had some phenomenal graphic design work that was even commended by the um, team that reviewed the application. Um, one of the other areas I'm really proud of is the creation of a new pre-registration form and process for residents to participate with uh, the commissioners, participate in BCC meetings. And through the creation of that form and that process, we've had more than 400 uh, partici participants completed online. So it has significantly increased our residents' ability to interact with the board and share their thoughts on important topics. 
Um, we've continued our crisis and emergency communications response. Um, we have ongoing work uh, throughout the year with emergency management on a host of products that keep our residents uh, safe, including the multilingual old hazard uh, prep guide. You all are very familiar with the work we do to translate a lot of our content, especially on the emergency management side. We have a lot of it in English and Spanish and Vietnamese. Um, and a big part of that is uh, thanks to the community outreach program that our team uh, leads. We have done a lot of work in the past few years to really grow that program, and now we have a steady stream of about 70 community and neighborhood leaders who have signed up to stay in touch with us to receive bilingual information. So it's like a fast track of information. You know, when we put out a press release, when we put out social media, um, they work with us to make sure that our residents who are not as connected to technology can get that information very quickly, and it's working really well. Uh, one other item I wanted to highlight is our work with Human Services on a virtual renter education program. You all know that's something that we did very recently. We had 45 community partners jump on that participation, uh, jump on that webinar, and the feedback that we got after what was really, really um, positive. 90% of them agreed to uh, share the resources that we created with their staff and or train their employees so that they could give that information out to uh, uh, local residents who are struggling with uh, the rent or understanding what their rights are as renters. So that was a very successful program. And I wanted to highlight it because it shows some of the work we're doing after implementing programs, which is evaluating and measuring were we successful? Did we reach the right people? Did we provide them with the information, the flyers, the, the booklets, the materials that will create a change in their behavior and helping our community? Also wanted to touch on our video and broadcasting team's work um, uh, for the Palm Room, but also they do a lot of work behind the scenes to save taxpayer dollars. We have really smart and savvy folks um, that I uh, can rely upon to look for creative technology solutions. And um, you know, every year it's just thousands of dollars that they save the community by being creative, by repurposing equipment, by knowing the latest trends and applying them here. And then lastly, I wanted to touch on the ongoing coordination of the regional PIO network, the public information network, which you all are familiar with. That obviously continues. We have monthly check-ins, and our municipal and community partners are really pivotal to sharing information from the county to their respective community. So this past year has been a lot of just getting in closer to the communities, getting closer to the ground, and working with our community partners. As far as performance measures, just um, very high level, I can speak to some of the trends that we are continuing to see. These started primarily with COVID, um, but we're continuing to see them um, in effect. Number one, our video content continues to skyrocket in terms of how many people that are engaging with it online. Um, I read a stat very recently that um, in the United States, now between 70 and 80% of the content that's consumed online is video products. And so we are continuing to work on our video strategy, following the trends, following the behaviors that people are using when they consume video so that we can speak to them with government information, but in a way that is appealing and that they can understand. So we've uh, actually been piloting a series called Discovering Pinellas, and we're gonna be talking some more about that in the future. Um, we continue to place our uh, content with local media, with regional media. Um, it's millions of dollars in advertising value equivalency every month. Um, that's money that our taxpayers are not having to put out. That's just, we do it because we have good relationships, because our media partners trust us, and because we have expanded into bilingual markets. And so we, we, we do a lot of work with them on a regular basis. Um, they actually come to us because they say, well, you're the only ones who will talk to us in you know, Spanish, or you'll, you're the only ones who will get us this. So that feels pretty good. It's very proactive. Um, we are gaining uh, approximately 300 uh, social media followers um, every month, and we are averaging about 650,000 impressions a month. So our social media presence is really strong, continues to grow. We are projected to uh, create about a million engagements online. That means that people are not ignoring what they're seeing. They're actually interacting with the content we're putting out. Um, what is next for the department? Over the next year, you're going to see a lot more updates on the new county website. I know I did a presentation a few months back. Um, we continue to be on track for completion by end of the summer. Um, we are now in phase two of end user testing. That is local residents who have volunteered to give it a look. And it's working exactly as we intended it. We send them version one. 
using best practices from our local government, from peers, and they came back and said, this is great, how about we do this? And so we're taking a look at that feedback. So I'm gonna feel very good when you get the final uh, product for your review and you know, before we, we go out uh, to the community, that it will be something that is really vetted by our residents and that it works for them. It's not just something that works for staff. And lastly, um, you will see a lot more work on our public participation strategy. So we have a lot of ways in which we interact with the departments throughout our departments. We're gonna be uh, facilitating and uh, bringing in some training to make sure that all of our departments get on the same page as far as how we talk to residents when it comes to different kinds of projects so we can all work from the same sheet of music. Um, so those are some of the highlights and things we're gonna be focusing on next year. Well, I think that talking to residents is probably the most, and, and uh, Courtney would tell you she's sick of me saying this, but whenever we have a complex issue or even sometimes not complex, but government heavy, I would say if we can't explain it to your neighbor, Mrs. Smith, that's not her fault, that's our fault. Yeah. And so that I appreciate y'all doing that. Mm -hmm. Questions? And then uh, let me thank uh, you for um, sharing your staff, uh, Arellis and uh, Tony and Fetty and, and Shan uh, on our community events. Um, a huge help, one, compiling the, the graphics and the information that we have, uh, but then they usually get dragged into volunteering a little bit and uh, some sweat equity. Uh, and last week we had one of our food distribution events with the free clinic and uh, we're a huge part of the success of that event. So I'm grateful for your department's role in that. Thank you, they're wonderful people. All right, I guess everyone's okay with your big budget increase. <laughs> Mr. Rose, what's next? So the county attorney's office is next and Yana will be presenting on that as well. And standing in for our county attorney is Mr. Don Crowell. Um, so the office of the county attorney is responsible for the representation of the Board of County Commissioners, constitutional offices, and um, all of the departments and boards um, of county government uh, in all legal matters relating to their official responsibilities. Um, the FY23 budget request is uh, close to $6 million with $5.5 million being the uh, personnel services. What is not part of the budget request, and this is in the topics for discussion, uh, it is actually a, a threat to uh, that have the potential to significantly impact the budget, is uh, the need to hire additional personnel um, if um, the litigation is to increase against the county, especially as a result um, of the Senate Bill 620. And if you have any questions on that, I'm pretty sure Don can um, answer those questions. But, um, if that bill is to uh, materialize, the uh, department will need to hire additional um, staff to help with the litigations. Um, so with the, uh, the FY23 budget for the department is increasing five, um, roughly $500,000 or 9.4 over the FY5, 9.4% uh, over the FY22 budget. Um, the main majority of the increase is, again, in personnel services. It's roughly $480,000, and that is attributed to the double encumbrance of two high-level positions. Um, there is also leave payout that is um, costing $60,000, and then there are um, some, re uh, some realignments of the positions, reclasses, and some promotions. Um, there is also a request to increase the outside legal counsel budget. That is the program within the county attorney's department. And based on the trends in the past few years, we um, actually decreased the budget in that program. Uh, but given the situation with the uh, um, uh, construction litigation and some potential um, looming construction litigation lawsuits, um, the department is asking to increase the uh, program by $50,000. Um, the capital outlay is decreasing by $22,000, um, and that is due to the uh, computer replacements. Um, again, as with the uh, communications, uh, that is part of the computer replacement program countywide. Mr. Rose. Thank you, Chair. Uh, you may hear this in a couple of different departments. Uh, computers have been reclassified from other operating to capital. And, and so you're just going to see it uh, kind of repeated over and over again. It just changes where it is in the line items of the budget. Just wanted to let you know. 
And unless Don has anything else to add, that is it for the uh, county attorney's office. Obviously, uh, Good afternoon, commissioners. Don Kroll. Obviously, I'm here uh, to answer any questions you may have. Uh, to the best of my abilities, trying to stand in Jules' stead, uh, as I'm sure you're all also aware, the county attorney oversight committee uh, will be meeting um, in the not too distant future, I believe. Uh, that, I'm not sure that's scheduled yet, but I know it's coming forward. Um, that she will highlight a lot of uh, the accomplishments of the office over the last year, as she does every time. So I don't want to steal too much thunder from that, but as you, uh, I'm sure, are all aware, we represent in our office not only the Board of County Commissioners and all of the departments under the board, uh, under Barry and the County Administration, but all of the other uh, uh, dependent district boards and such that, uh, that you guys deal with, like your conduit financing entities, the health facilities authority, the educational facilities authority, the others, as well as the constitutional officers, the clerk, the supervisor of elections, the tax collector, the property appraiser. There's a lot of varied uh, types of law that have to be covered to deal with a lot of that. So. Um, we're, we're proud of the group we've put together. We've been able, uh, historically, to have long tenure and people able to um, provide a lot of uh, historical and institutional knowledge that, uh, that carries some, some real benefits to it, as well as um, understanding kind of where the, the desires of the board tend to lean uh, as far as helping guide uh, in a counselor role kind of uh, type of position. But we do have uh, recently David Sadowski retired from our office after 30 plus years, uh, and we have a new attorney who will be starting on uh, the 20th, uh, Maria White. She's coming in as an attorney one. So it's, uh, you know, we have one of our most senior lawyers we're replacing with an entry level lawyer. We cannot always do that, but we strive to do that where we can. Um, we also have a very another long tenured lawyer who um, we don't have any exact date on, but the payout has been scheduled. He has a lot of uh, vacation pay in there, so there's a number in there. And then um, HR also did some reclassification looks, as you heard Yana allude to, that moved some of our, our uh, lowest paid attorneys up to deal with market pressures. Um, and that required some, some adjustments in there. So with that, uh, I will let y'all ask any questions y'all might have. And um, if not, uh, we'll keep it brief. All right, and just August 4th is the uh, Oversight Committee meeting. Commissioner Long. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of things, Don, if I might. Yes, ma'am. What kind of retention issues is the county attorney's office seeing, if any? Over the last several years, we've had uh, lawyers leave, um, and they tend to be in the the earlier part of their career or middle part of their career. Uh, we've had some, some have been lost to developers and, and home building companies. We had another one uh, move to uh, Atlanta to join uh, a firm up there. Uh, I, I hesitate to, well, I won't, I won't couch it that way. I think that there is a different approach to uh, careers than perhaps there was when I started uh, 23 years ago. Uh, people tend to move around a lot more. Uh, and the private sector has different um, attractors than the county. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we will continue to be able to attract talent, but um, it's what's important to the market that becomes difficult. And many times with what we're seeing right now, it's, it's just the dollar signs rather than those longer term benefits um, for some segments. Um, so far we've been fortunate, uh, but we have gotten many, many, many less resumes than we used to to try and fill the same spots, even at those entry level positions. So. So um, do you feel that you're, when you talk about the money issue, are your salaries competitive, for example? The, <clears throat> there's always a struggle there because um, 
uh, it purely on salary, uh, I would say it's very difficult to compare that to the private sector. There are a lot of other benefits that the county offers that we try to um, underscore, uh, but that is with greater or lesser uh, success depending on the candidate and what their individual goals are. I hate to paint with too broad a brush, but I will tell you that, uh, again, I think the, the greatly reduced number of applications and resumes we have seen over the last couple of attempts to fill positions are dramatically different from even just five years ago when we would ask, we would uh, uh, advertise for a position and we would get dozens and dozens of resumes. It, that's just not happening anymore. And, and uh, that said, even when we do get things, we'll, we'll have a position for an attorney, but we get resumes from law students that haven't passed the bar yet. Well, that's great, <laughs> but we need somebody we can use today. So um, I know that's a kind of a roundabout answer to your question, but we have asked HR in the past, and I, uh, Jewel has always done a good job of continuing to ask HR to look at our positions. That is reflected in at least the attorney one position here and the change to the budget here um, because they were not competitive. Um, so I am not an expert in that field. I can tell you that we do have experts in that field look at it and, and I can only give you the anecdotal data that I'm, I'm kind of referred to. That's fine. I was just curious about how competitive we really were. Um, Lastly, I ha as someone who has recently had experience being exposed to the ways in which the county attorney's office prepares for trials and the hours and hours of research and work that goes into that preparation, I have to say I was amazingly impressed. I'm, I haven't been able to stop talking about it since just because the attention to detail and the knowledge of the law were outstanding. And um, as I've heard Commissioner Justice say so often, it's just a damn shame that we didn't have an opportunity for the court to hear the arguments of the reason why we were there. Um, so thank you for all of your hard work and all of that. I have to say, you know, we just really don't have that much exposure to the county attorney's office or the amazingly talented people that are there. And that leads me to my last point. I don't believe I've ever seen a total list of the different types of law and expertise that our folks have. And I think that would be very informative to my colleagues as well as myself because Sometimes I think we tend to take for granted what Jewel actually is representing when she sits there in terms of the magnitude of the responsibilities that you all take care of on behalf of our constitutional officers as well. So I just wanted to say a heartfelt thanks from me to you. Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, it's always nice to, to hear kind words. Um, our litigation team, uh, led up by uh, Christy Pemberton, is our litigation manager. Um, I would put them up against anyone. Uh, Christy uh, does a great job, and she has developed a team that is very, very thorough. And you're right, litigation is a lot, a lot of hard work. Um, as far as the breadth of legal issues that the county attorney's office deals with, um, we often tell people that we do everything except family law. Um, in some form or another, we touch, uh, even our local ordinance violation stuff is tried under the criminal rules of procedure in county court when we go to that point. Uh, we, we do uh, statements of claim and probate matters uh, on issues that uh, often relate to EMS charges or things like that. We deal with regulatory schema from healthcare uh, and ambulance services uh, to solid waste to um, uh, justice coordination. Uh, we deal with technical issues with the business technology people and, and that ranges from trying to help 
craft scopes of work that meet all of the regulatory requirements within contracts to dealing with contract administration, to dealing with litigation where those things go bad, to trip and falls on sidewalks and car accidents. So um, I, if I were to put together a list, it would be missing many holes. Uh, we have more than half of our office are board certified as city, county, local government specialists by the Florida Bar. Um, that is a rel of the, it used to be, and I, I haven't checked this number lately, but uh, it used to be less than 5% of the lawyers in the state were board certified. In order to be, call yourself a, an expert or a specialist, you have to be board certified. Kind of the irony with local government lawyers is we are specialists in being generalists because the scope and area of the things that we touch, to your point, is so broad. Again, from land use to ambulance services to parks to solid waste and sewer and water. I mean, the, those things don't cross over anywhere but here. Uh, so anyway, uh, with that, if there's any other questions or follow up, I can. Commissioner Gerard. Just a clarification. So the uh, the $500,000 increase does not include any increase in staff. You still no, have the same number of STEs. That's correct. You were talking about um, maybe needing more for Senate Bill 620. But. Well, that's well, and yes, the Senate Bill 620 notification, first of all, just to touch on that, that has not yet, I just checked again, has not yet been sent to the governor. Uh, I know there has been significant outreach to try and get him to veto that bill. Um, and frankly, we we were asked to essentially make point out any places where these numbers might wildly get different. Now, to a great degree, um, this body, the Board of County Commissioners, has the ability to to control to some degree how those uh, that litigation might go. But we wanted to make sure that we we pointed out that this is a whole new area of potential liability that um, that we're not as we stand necessarily equipped to deal with if um, things play out in, in, in ways that we can't necessarily predict. So we just kind of wanted to point that piece out. Right. Um, I also just wanted to let you know that the uh, public defender's office and the state attorney's office are having a terrible time recruiting and retaining staff. So there's <laughs> oh, yeah. competition is probably from the other governments as well as the private sector, but they should know that if you're working for a big firm, you're going to work 18, 20 hour days. Well, and, and law for, schools really. For a lot of money, but. Law schools really o oversold their product for a long time. And there were a lot of people who went to law school and I think got disenfranchised, got very discouraged trying to find work at the places they thought they could for a while and probably moved on. And I'm, I think that that enrollment has dropped off and, and you just don't have the same flow of people into the profession that you used to. It's not the same profession it was. And you saw that 2% unemployment uh, this morning right. in Pinellas very, County, very low. so that goes across every profession. Anybody, anything else for our county attorney? You know, I think uh, it's been a couple of years um, since uh, we had a, a, some meeting where I think a good portion of the county attorney's office came into the meeting room. Um, might be a little crowded in the assembly room, but maybe one day when we're here uh, for a work session to have the attorney staff come over just so we can put some faces with names, I think that would be a great thing and give us a chance to thank people in person. Well, thank you and, and Commissioner Long for bringing that up. That was something I had considered talking with Jewel about as well and I will certainly bring that forward. Um, there are a lot of people who every day uh, deal with the day-to-day -day behind the scenes issues and one of the other things I like to say is when you don't see anything about them in the paper, it's a good thing. <laughs> so the fact that you don't see them or hear their names is, is probably a good thing. And uh, so at any rate. Okay. We'll work on a calendar for that. Very good. Anything else? All right. Mr. Burton, anything else? Tomorrow we have eight departments. We, um, so... so uh, so we we uh, finishing at 1.30 today, so a little bit more tomorrow, so two. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a pretty full plate tomorrow, um, you know, but, uh, you know, again, I think, uh, you know, we, we took some big ones on today, like utilities and things like that, so. Nope, um, absolutely. But, um, but, yeah, we have a full plate tomorrow, and, you know, see you then. Please plan accordingly, and uh, we'll see you bright and early tomorrow. Have a great evening. Thank you. We're adjourned.